Crow's Eye, you call me. Well, who has a keener eye than the Crow? After every battle, the Crows come in their hundreds and their thousands to feast upon the fallen. The Crow can espy death from afar. And I say that all Westeros is dying. Those who follow me will feast until the end of their days. We are the Ironborn. And once we were conquerors, our writ ran everywhere the sound of the waves was heard. My brother would have you be content with the cold and dismal north. My niece with even less. But I shall give you Lannisport, Highgarden, the Arbor, Old Town, the Riverlands and the Reach, the Kingswood and the Rainwood, Dorne and the Marches, the Mountains of the Moon and the Vale of Arryn, Tarth and the Stepstones. I say we take it all. I say we take Westeros. He glanced at the priest. All for the greater glory of our drowned god, to be sure. For half a heartbeat, even Aaron was swept away by the boldness of his words. The priest had dreamed the same dream, when first he'd seen the red comet in the sky. We shall sweep over the green lands with fire and sword, root out the seven gods of the Septons and the white trees of the Northmen. Another gem of a quote from George R. R. Martin there that just does so much. It encapsulates Euron's grand ambition, clearly. Also, there's a lot of history of the Ironborn from Euron there, obviously giving a leg up in our view, my view, our view. <laughs> On top of that, it shows his charisma. Even Aaron, who hates him, who's terrified of him, in that moment, he was desperate to keep Euron from winning the King's Moot. He's swept away by his words. Like, what does that tell you? And it hints as well at the tearing down of the gods that we later see in the Forsaken chapter. Not something Aaron imagined in the moment, something he's confronted with later. In any case, it hits a lot harder upon the release of the Forsaken chapter. Euron Greyjoy is here. So hello and welcome to another episode of History of Westeros, a podcast dedicated to George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire book series, as well as HBO's Game of Thrones. So let's get into it. Right on. First of all, a quick bit of news. We had a great time at Ice and Fire Con 2017 a couple months ago, and we're looking forward to Con of Thrones next month at the end of June 2017. If you're watching this episode later than that, we'll be looking out for Ice and Fire Con 2018 and Con of Thrones 2018, or 19, or 20, <laughs> never know. So definitely a big shout out to those two cons. We'll both be participating in Con of Thrones on some panels. Aziz is on like a dozen panels, I think. That's right. And our co-host for our show-only series, the Game of Thrones coverage, Sean of House Beard, will also be a panelist there as well. So come meet us and say hello. Also, thanks to our patrons, Jeff Gnarly, the Long Snapper, uh, the History of Westeros First Sword, as well as Lord Mark of House Joseph, the Snow in Winterfell, and writer of Masla Cartho, the white dragon with green scales, horns, wings, and talons. Look at him grow. Look at that art by Azani. If you want to join in the fun and get a dragon rider of your own, go to patreon.com slash history of Westeros. Check out the benefits. See what we have. See what fits for you. And go from there. All right. We have a lot to talk about with Euron. This episode is big. It reminded me, in some ways, of the Varus Illyrio episode that we did a while ago, many years ago. In that, you've got someone whose motives are difficult to quite figure out. Someone who has a lot going on. There's a lot of mystery around. A lot of possibilities. And, of course, it's even bigger because Euron, as you'll see, is a big part of what we're calling the Endgame. He's a third-act villain. So let's talk about some of that. Now, the Ironborn story has stayed hot, relatively speaking, because they've been such a major part of the pre-released Winds of Winter chapters that we've gotten during the wait for the next book, including the most recent Winds of Winter chapter and the most telling, most revealing Winds of Winter chapter, both of which are the Forsaken. And that also presented us with a bit of a tricky element of beyond what I said about how this is kind of like Varus Illyrio, and it's that we've covered some of this stuff already, and we want to avoid overlap. We did a lot on the Forsaken, we did a lot on the Dragonbinder horn, which we called the Hell Horn, and that was a couple of years ago as well, so there's a lot we've covered already, but it just goes to show, looking at the length of this episode, there's just so much to talk about with Euron. Yeah, we're going to do our best to compartmentalize what we've already covered here. For example, we discussed Euron's military and political maneuvers at the Shield Islands and discussed whether or not he actually went to Valyria. 
We also fleshed out his plans for Old Town and for the Red Wine Fleet, especially the possibility of a real Kraken via Horn, and the same with dragons. And we, of course, went through Aaron Dampere's Shade of the Evening Dreams. Now, that's a lot, but like I said, there's so much left. There's, it's really amazing. We didn't cover Euron's story arc, his historical parallels, like the Bloodstone Emperor, nor his early life, which includes a possible connection to Bloodraven. So both his current life and his old life, all kinds of magic stuff going on there. And nor have we discussed his full connection to the endgame elements. He actually connects to a lot of the POV characters in ways that you may not have realized. And while we've talked about Euron and the dragons quite a lot, we have not done so for Euron and the others themselves. So that's going to be big. And Euron himself being a big uncertain topic and our community being so talented, we brought in a special guest. So let's get with the introductions, shall we? Introducing someone whom a lot of you know already, Emmett Booth, a.k.a. Poor Quentin. How you doing, man? Thanks for having me on. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Emmett Booth. I go by Poor Quentin. You can find my Song of Ice and Fire related stuff at poorquentin.tumblr.com or just at Poor Quentin on Twitter. And I'm a big fan of this character in particular, so I'm looking forward to talking about him. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for joining us. And it was great to meet you in person at Ice and Fire Con 2017. And we'll be sharing the stage at Con of Thrones 2017 as well. Poor Quentin's on a ton of panels and some of them with us. So look out for that. Now, one way we can get a sense of Euron's place in the story is by considering... The Meta History. Meta History. Now, as a reminder, we define Meta History as a gathering of all the details about a character outside the world itself, such as Martin's plan for Euron, what he envisioned his arc to be, versus what it became over time. George's Gardner style of writing, where he lets the characters and storylines grow in the telling, is vital here. He has endgames in mind and fates for most characters, but sometimes he changes midstream. Now, there's a misconception out there about George R. R. Martin's style. People in our fandom and some critics like to point out that George is a breaker of tropes. And it's true, but this idea is often taken too far. He is certainly a breaker of tropes and expectations, but not 100% of the time. If yeah, he were, that yeah. would be just as predictable as never breaking a trope. That's a good point. You can use an unoriginal trope in an original way and by mixing it up. Even familiar tropes can catch us off guard. Well played, George. That's just one of many ways at looking at Euron. The character himself, I find very unusual and compelling and damn fun, despite being such a horrible person. Hey, I like Victorian too, and well, he's not as bad, but he's pretty bad. It's just more that I like the way the character is written. Very different, Euron is, from his own people in many ways. And in some ways, he's the epitomized steroids version of their culture. You're on the person in world is unpredictable and mysterious. His origin and goals and how he's going to accomplish all this, that's a matter of debate and the wait for the winds of winter. <laughs> it's on the complicated side of things, shall we say. But his place in the story is less simple, though not simple. We've been building up to a character like this. Those characters who haven't died off have become stronger over time. Risen again, harder and stronger, you might say. Yeah, they've become kings and queens, assassins and intriguers. Many of them have become quite good at fighting or now command armies or dragons. Yeah, or, you know, all of the above, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no one's a queen, king, and assassin, and commander of army <laughs> and dragons. Anyway. Yeah. That, yeah, right, that would be an even bigger badass, right? But heck, seriously, multiple characters are apparently literal saviors, as foretold by ancient prophecy. I mean, uh, you don't get much bigger than that, right? Mm. And so as the story progresses and our heroes become more powerful, well, you can't just roll another Joffrey out there, right? As nasty and dangerous as he was, he was the villain for the first act. Ultimately, a weak, not very bright teenager. I.e., nowhere near Euron's level. The third act villain. Joffrey was written with characters like Sansa in mind. He's an antagonist to her and to Ned and some others, but he certainly would be mincemeat if he actually ever faced someone remotely competent in a real sword fight. Like, just how Sansa would be pretty helpless if she was faced with Euron, at least as things stand now. Sansa has progressed to dealing with someone far more sophisticated than Joffrey, right? She's now dealing with Littlefinger. He's a lot more dangerous. We don't anticipate her having much to do with Euron directly. Well, you never know. But Daenerys, however, she appears to be headed for direct conflict with Euron. 
And though he knows it, and though she only has a vague hint, let's look at her progression a bit. Yeah, it's funny to look at her transition in this way and how danger is really just relative. Currently, Daenerys has people from many nations who want to, or are bound by tradition to, kill or enslave her. She deals with incredibly dangerous threats on a regular basis. Compare that to back at the start of her rise to power when her chief worry was Viserys. <laughs> so to say things have gotten tougher is a vast understatement. Yeah, I mean, Viserys literally bragged about how he was going to kill Robert Baratheon in single combat and thought Khal Drogo should worry about him <laughs> in the same manner. I mean, that was Danny's early problem, right? And then getting used to the Dothraki, it just escalated from there. So that's what we mean. You can't just roll out another Viserys, another Joffrey, and expect Danny to start worrying or to be intimidated. It takes somebody a lot bigger and stronger. I mean, really, Viserys was a bit of a joke. He was weak-minded and a little bit crazy. <laughs> Somehow, Euron's claims in a vacuum are arguably crazier while also being far more believable. But yeah, both aimed for the Iron Throne. But we laugh at Viserys. <laughs> Euron, though... We get the sense that he might pull off at least parts of his plan, even though it might seem crazier. <laughs> and he's fearless, he's got a vision and the skill to make it happen, unlike Viserys or Joffrey. So even if he only gets part of the way there, even if he fails in his grand ambition, he can do so much damage along the way to levels that I would call tragic, and I think we should prepare ourselves for that exactly. Now, we are downplaying first act Joffrey and Viserys in comparison to third act Euron. But again, as we expect Euron to do some damage, it's bolstered, or that argument is bolstered by the fact that Joffrey, despite being a little weak and pathetic, he actually did do serious damage, right? I mean, he was responsible for Ned being executed. He screwed a lot of things up for some major people. And let's not forget about second act Ramsay Bolton, kind of the villain in between the two, and he's not through yet. Yeah, Ramsay might just have to up his game. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't want him to, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Euron is to Ramsay as Balerion the Black Dread is to Balerion the Kitten. <laughs> be jealous, Ramsay. You want to be seen as a legitimate heir? Well, Euron is already a king. You play with dogs? Well, Euron plays with dragons and possibly krakens. You broke weak-minded Theon, Euron broke a warlock of Karth and his friends and many others. What is this, in a Song of Ice and Fire rap battle right here? <laughs> it could be. <laughs> could be, yeah, a pretty good one. Euron would win that too. <laughs> but they do have a lot in common. In several ways, Euron is Ramsay plus Joffrey plus more. No, not as if he's the child of them, no. <laughs> Joffrey lacks cunning, Ramsay lacks authority, and Viserys had neither. Euron, on the other hand, has both. Joffrey lacks respect. Ramsay lacks birth status. Euron has both. All four of them have strong emotional reactions when their authority is challenged. Something else they have in common. Especially the born kings, Joff and Viserys. Euron is the most composed, though. He doesn't like it, but he keeps his cool. Now, all of them also enjoy cruelty, which is perhaps the thing that most marks them as evil. The most as villainous. And that, which above all else, I mean, what else is there? That's, yeah. right? That's about as bad as it gets in the real world. In this, Euron is also the most sophisticated. Joffrey, and like Viserys, is pretty much straight and simple brutality. Ramsay inherited eons of Bolton torture skill, and he's got a little more understanding of psychology, but still, Euron is on another level here, too. And the Forsaken really showed us how deep his understanding of psychology and his willingness to use it against that person in torment is willing to go. It's crazy. I mean, doesn't this look like an evil person to you? If you're on YouTube or Acast, you can see a picture of Euron right here. This piece is by Mike Hallstein, who you can find at mikehallstein.artstation.com. That's right. We've had Mike's art on before. You can see the man is full of good pieces. Family ties, on the other hand, not, don't mean a whole lot to Joffrey. But he didn't kill any of his own family. He's not a kinslayer. Maybe he would have, given the chance. He did die young. <laughs> Ramsay... Well, he took out Domeric Bolton, according to Roos, and may take out Roos himself and or Lady Walda and her upcoming child. So Ramsay may yet jump up on the Kinslayer leaderboards. <laughs> he certainly doesn't have that scruple in any case. Gods be damned. <laughs> Euron, however, still has him beat in this department, even if Ramsay does kill his father. Now, I'm downplaying Ramsay a bit, like I did with Joffrey, but he's done a lot of damage, and he remains dangerous. So, 
Theon, for example, can stay on stage here for a minute as he's a good example twice in a row. Who will he traumatize along the way? <laughs> Euron, meaning surely he's going to cut out some more tongues, for example. Yeah, we really do worry that Tyrion will lose his tongue, but we discussed that in our episode on the Forsaken, so we're not going to traumatize you again with more talk of that. Yeah, I mean, Tyrion, that would be traumatizing for him, but it would also be traumatizing for us, right? <laughs> Now, as a story element, it has long seemed as though the Ironborn were the vehicle for Daenerys to cross over from Essos. And Euron's mentioned early on as someone formidable was never meant to be in passing. George was playing the long game there, getting Euron established a bit, even though he's off screen. So when he does come along later, as he did in A Feast for Crows, we've already had the setup. A Storm of Swords, Catelyn V. Euron Crows, I they call him, as black a pirate as ever raised a sail. He's been gone for years, but Lord Balon was no sooner cold than there he was, sailing into Lannisport in his silence. Black sails and a red hull and crewed by mutes. He'd been to Ashai and back, I heard. Wherever he was, though, his home now, and he marched right into Pike and sat his ass in the sea stone chair and drowned Lord Botley in a cask of sea water when he objected. That was when I ran back to Myraham and slipped anchor hoping I could get away whilst things were confused. So I did, and here I am. Something we've pointed out many times, something we've repeated often, is that when George often repeats something, you should pay attention, especially when he brings something up well in advance of it actually happening, like Euron's appearance. He's brought up in A Clash of Kings, mentioned again in A Storm of Swords, but we don't actually see him till A Feast for Crows. So, the information here that's repeated early is Euron. And you may notice going forward that these early mentions always seem to include a shout out to a shy, because nothing says you've gone really far than a shy. <laughs> yeah, it's like the place to name if you want to sound like you've been all over. That's their travel slogan. <laughs> it's like the hipster traveler thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so from early a clash of kings to mid a storm of swords, Euron was originally not meant to be seen until after the five year gap, it seems. And he was a huge beneficiary of the gap scrap in terms of screen time, right? Feast and Dance have a lot of Ironborn chapters, which I think is more satisfying than him becoming important later. We get more of a slow build this way. And not to mention, the Ironborn are set themselves, not just Euron, to be huge in the third act. Yeah, there are as many Greyjoy point of views, as of this writing, as of this podcast, for as any other house, assuming we count Jon as a Stark. Now, all four of these Ironborn point of views are observing and or reacting to Euron's moves. They're basically all kind of revolving around his center of gravity. And as we do with characters, our usual chronological progression will be partnered with our also usual look at the setting as it changed around Euron as he aged. Normally, I'd focus a lot on how his environment affected him, and it certainly did, and I certainly will. But this guy, unlike few other characters, flips that script and instead shapes the environment around himself, even as a young man, as much or more as it does to him. Now there's the in-story chronology, which is forthcoming, of course, but first, the chronology of Euron in A Song of Ice and Fire, from the reader's perspective. Not Roderick the Reader. <laughs> first mention. A Clash of Kings, Theon won. His father's war was long done and lost. This was Theon's hour. His plan, his glory, and in time, his crown. Yet if the long ships are hosting... It might only be a caution. Now that he thought on it. A defensive move, lest the war spill out across the sea. Old men were cautious by nature. His father was old now, and so to his uncle Victorian, who commanded the Iron Fleet. His uncle Euron was a different song, to be sure, but the silence did not seem to be in port. It's important to remember that until this moment, this quote, Theon hadn't spent a second of his adult life on the Iron Islands, and he leaves again pretty quickly once Balon declares war. So saying he was a different song, to be sure, is something to consider. It means that Theon is aware of Euron and his deeds, despite being so far away. I mean, Theon knows about Euron and his own people, but his beliefs and his understanding are from a 10-year-old's perspective and then from afar living at Winterfell. And this is borne out by how he's treated when he gets back, right? The Ironborn kind of just make fun of him and, and look what Asha does to him and all that. 
And a lot of George R. R. Martin's original intent for these characters is found in these first Theon chapters, which are our first close look at the Ironborn themselves. Now, even though he doesn't know them well, he's not too far off on a lot of things, except for the matter of who he's talking to here. A clash of kings, Theon too. During my lord father's rebellion, he sailed into Lannisport with my uncle Euron and burned the Lannister fleet where it lay at anchor. Theon recalled. The plan was Euron's, though. Victorian is like some great great bullock, strong and tireless and dutiful, but not like to win any races. No doubt he'll serve me as loyally as he served my lord father. He has neither the wits nor the ambition to plot betrayal. Euron Crow's eye has no lack of cunning, though. I've heard men say terrible things of that one. Theon shifted his seat. My uncle Euron has not been seen in the islands for close on two years. He may be dead. If so, it might be for the best. Lord Balon's eldest brother had never given up the old way, even for a day. His silence, with its black sails and dark red hull, was infamous in every port from Ibn to Ashai, it was said. So that's Theon speaking with Esgrid, who is, of course, Asha. Theon has been away so long he's forgotten her, and that's a reminder of how out of touch he is with the Ironborn. He's been gone since he was ten, so basically half his life. And Winterfell isn't exactly a hotbed of information on what the Greyjoys are up to. <laughs> His Greyjoy brothers are probably not famous enough for Theon to be hearing news of them from, say, Maester Lewin every once in a while. And he probably just wouldn't want to bring it up to Theon in general. <laughs> That's true. I don't remind him of what, <laughs> what, they're, what they're up to. And a reminder clue here is that Theon wonders if Euron's dead. He doesn't know. That's a point of how out of touch he is. So it also shows us that his information can't be that fresh. Another example is Euron's exile. It wasn't common knowledge. Asha herself assumed Euron killed Victarion's wife at first because she was off reaving when it all happened and only heard whispers when she got back. So she was largely in the dark, which means that we can safely assume Theon knows even less. I mean, he wasn't there. He was even farther away than Asha was and speaking to people who didn't have any idea. But despite that, Theon still mentions that Euron is known from Ib to Ashai line. He's still aware of that much. So that's interesting. We should dive in a little deeper. So one thing to read from that reading is that he's a character for later, right? Something we've been building up here. His role in the story, mostly forthcoming. And obviously, how weird would it be if George just threw Euron out there starting in book six and we hadn't even heard of him? He's just some random Greyjoy that all of a sudden starts dominating and kicking ass. That wouldn't be good writing. And consider that Theon's point of view was added in a Clash of Kings, and one of the first things it does is bring Euron up. And then Theon himself disappears for two books, only to emerge again, just as Euron and the Ironborn are really becoming important. So that alone shows why he's a character for a later act, or later acts. But there's another clue. And once again, we can look at the five-year gap as a bellwether for George's plans. Since the gap was supposed to come after A Storm of Swords, and Euron doesn't appear before... Well, we're really narrowing things down, but we got to keep in mind that Balon dies before Feast. Either way, that was something that was part of Euron's setup. And that must mean that George kept that part of the plan. It worked. Yeah, so compare this to Dorne, which is the other major kingdom that rises from relative obscurity in the early series to becoming key going forward. Now, there are many reasons that Martin gives for his uh, scrap of the gap, but one of the reasons he likes to point to the most is that he needed to show the reaction to the Red Viper's death. And similarly, the death of the gap allowed us to see the reaction to Balon's death. Likely, Martin's original plan didn't involve the King's moot, or if it did, we'd only have seen it in flashback. Yeah, I imagine the original plan was just Euron becoming king more normal way. He sails in and just kind of says, hey, I'm king now, and no one else can stop him. Maybe that was the original plan. But with more time to flesh it out, he made it a little more interesting. In fact, I'd say a lot more interesting. So he gave himself more leeway. That also meant Euron was fleshed out sooner than he would have. And I think that's a good thing. Because without the gap, most of his introduction would have come after. And he'd have already been ruling the Iron Islands for many years. Five, I guess, when we first met him. So... What would have happened there? There's a lot of things that maybe wouldn't have worked. Like, would Euron have those warlocks still five years later just mm-hmm. rotting in the hull of his ship? Like, I don't think that would fit. So I think things like that were an addition in place of the gap. 
Of note here is that Quaith's prophecy originally, in the pre-release form, included mention of Euron. When she's listing all the people coming to hear the... coming to Daenerys, I mean, the words are Kraken and Dark Flame, which is Victorian and Makoro. But the line used to be Crow and Kraken, so it seems pretty clear that Euron was originally set to go to Daenerys, seems. Yeah, I think that seems like a good conclusion. Anyway... We get a better version because of the gap being scrapped. Euron Greyjoy is not only at war already, rather than waiting for five years, doing whatever George would have had him do, but we get to know him so much better, and it's not an easy look. <laughs> we didn't compare him to Ramsay and Joffrey just for effect. As villains, they do have much in common, despite Euron outclassing them. But all villains have origin stories, just like superheroes. Supervillains have them too. So let's take a look. Becoming Crow's Eye. Euron was born somewhere between 256 and 268. Now, we lean towards the younger range of that because of what he looks like and because of the age of his brothers, but let's leave it at that. He's roughly in his mid-30s to early 40s. He was the fifth son of Kellon Greyjoy of nine total, the ultimate middle child. <laughs> Only one of his four elder brothers survived to adulthood, having their childhoods cut short, with some thanks to Euron himself. <laughs> Balon was, of course, the one of four, and with thanks to Euron, again, had his adulthood cut short. But <laughs> that was much later. It seems that he got along pretty well with Balon for a long time. Well enough, anyway, compared to how well he gets along with everybody else. <laughs> yeah, eventually he had some big ideas, to put it mildly. <laughs> yeah. Euron's ambitions increased over time, and tracing the path of that growth is entertaining, as you'll see in this section by Poor Quentin. Touched by a raven. Ever since Euron Greyjoy was introduced in A Feast for Crows, a fair amount of readers have been asking one question of his character. What's the point? This fearsome reputation, this intense imagery, these monologues about gods and power. What's it all about? Where is Euron coming from and where is he going? Why is he in the story at all? I think there's a through line from his origin story to his goal that answers these questions. So I want to examine Euron's origin story and what it tells us about him and how George Martin conceives of his character. And by that I mean not just the what and the where, but the why. Why is it that in a family full of revanchist pirates, Euron turned out a globe-trotting, bad-tripping sorcerer? In RPG terms, what is it that led him to choose the staff over the sword? The Reaver, a feast for crows. When I was a boy, I dreamed that I could fly, he announced. When I woke, I couldn't, or so the maester said. But what if he lied? Euron delivers this line to his brother Victarion, alone together in Euron's chambers but for the sleeping folly of flowers. And this is right after Euron's weakest moment in the text so far. The Reaver, a feast for crows. It's the arbor we want, said Red Ralph, and the other men took the cry. The crow's eye let the shouts wash over him. Then he leapt down from the table, grabbed his slattern by the arm, and pulled her from the hall. Fled. Like a dog. Euron's hold upon the sea stone chair suddenly did not seem as secure as it had a few moments before. They will not follow him to Slaver's Bay. Perhaps they are not such dogs as fools as I had feared. And it comes right before Euron reveals that he's changed his plans and will be sending Victarion to Slaver's Bay in his stead. So he's in a contemplative, reflective mood, reviewing his agenda and what it means to him. Euron is self-examining and unearthing what's really important to him, what's driving him. This is Euron's Rosetta Stone. Like any supervillain origin story worth its salt, it's the key to unlocking his character beneath all of the sound and fury. So let's break it down. When I was a boy, I dreamt that I could fly. You know, that sounds familiar to me. A Game of Thrones, Bran 3. Now, Bran, the crow urged, choose, fly, or die. Death reached for him, screaming. Bran spread his arms and flew. Wings unseen drank the wind and filled and pulled him upward. The terrible needles of ice receded below him. The sky opened up above. Bran soared. It was better than climbing. It was better than anything. The world grew small beneath him. I'm flying, he cried out in delight. I've noticed, said the three-eyed crow. It took to the air, flapping its wings in his face, slowing him, blinding him. He faltered in the air as its pinions beat against his cheeks. Its beak stabbed at him fiercely. 
and Bran felt a sudden blinding pain in the middle of his forehead, between his eyes. When I woke, I couldn't. Now that also sounds pretty familiar. A Game of Thrones, Bran three. It was just a lie, he said bitterly, remembering the crow from his dream. I can't fly. I can't even run. Or so the maester said. But what if he lied? And so does that. A Game of Thrones, Bran three. I want to learn magic, Bran told him. The crow promised that I would fly. Mr. Lewin sighed. I can teach you history, healing, herb law. I can teach you the speech of ravens and how to build a castle and the way a sailor steers his ship by the stars. I can teach you to measure the days and mark the seasons. And at the Citadel in Old Town, they can teach you a thousand things more. But, Bran, no man can teach you magic. So what we have here is an uncanny parallel to Blood Raven recruiting Bran as a potential Greenseer, unleashing his magical potential. And we know from Bran's visions that he's far from the first kid visited by a three-eyed bird in his dreams. A Game of Thrones, Bran Three. There was nothing below him now but snow and cold and death. A frozen wasteland where jagged blue-white spires of ice waited to embrace him. They flew up at him like spears. He saw the bones of a thousand other dreamers impaled upon their points. But what would qualify Euron to be among those so visited? Well, Bloodraven tells us the qualification directly. A Dance with Dragons, Bran Three. Only one man in a thousand is born a skin changer, Lord Brynden said one day, after Bran had learned to fly. And only one skin changer in a thousand can be a green seer. So you have to be a skin changer, an exceptionally powerful skin changer at that. And skin changers are not unknown on the Iron Islands, as we see with the Farwinds. There's some other circumstantial evidence pointing to Euron being a former protege of Blood Ravens. Look at Euron's nickname, the Crow's Eye. Both Crow and Eye are words strongly associated with Blood Raven. Just look at Three Eyed Crow or Thousand Eyes in One. Damp Hair also refers to Euron's hidden eye as the Blood Eye in The Forsaken, which would also seem to point in Blood Raven's direction. And then there's Euron's Banner, which displays birds crowning a red eye, a perfect symbolic image of one's third eye being opened by the Three Eyed Crow. This also fits Blood Raven's character perfectly. If you look at his tenure as Hand of the King, a clear pattern emerges. Blood Raven was so focused on a singular goal that he ignored all else, believing that his ends, namely defeating the Blackfires, justified any and all means. He was willing to execute Anus Blackfire, set up a massive surveillance state, even empower the Greyjoys to raid at will, if that meant he could focus on tearing down Bitter Steel and his Black Dragons. And ironically, that mindset ended up undercutting the very monarchy he was trying to protect. I would argue that even as Blood Raven has gone from Hand to Greenseer, from the political realm to the magical realm, this pattern has held. He was so singularly focused on defeating the others that he was, once again, willing to empower the worst of the Greyjoys. And that, too, was going to come around to put Blood Raven's goal of saving the world in jeopardy. Now, if this is true, what does it mean for Euron's character? I think this backstory, like any good origin story, explains Euron's motivations, grounding all the crazy metaphysical fireworks he gets into later. In terms of what Euron did with his life from that dream forward, the key line here is, but what if he lied? Euron's third eye was open to his potential, a world of magical power and insight he could tap into, the revelation that he could fly. And when he woke up, he was told that he couldn't, and he's been trying to prove that maester wrong ever since. This, I believe, explains why Euron is so different from everyone else around him, why he has such scorn for the Ironborn and has set his sights so much higher and weirder. This is why he's so interested in the occult, why he's so fascinated by Valyrian artifacts and psychedelic drugs, why he talks so often about the relationship between man and god, and why he believes that he deserves to transcend the former category in favor of the latter. This is the core of his character. As a child, he was visited in his dreams and told he had the potential to be one of the most powerful people on the planet. Every time Euron taps into a new well of power, he's trying to recreate that initial high. His goal, as he outlines for Damp Hair and the Forsaken, is transcendence. Euron is out to prove that the maester indeed lied, that the crow's eye can fly. A major implication here is that Bloodraven gave up on Euron despite recognizing his special talent. Given that Bloodraven is basically getting inside Euron's head, 
it may have been as simple as realizing how ugly it is in there. <laughs> Even a get-the-job-done-at-all-costs kind of guy like Bloodraven may have balked and backed off on helping a budding Euron develop magical powers. Yeah, even that might have been too much for him. <laughs> this was early in life, and we have a good example of how the ugliness in his mind manifested itself. It might be what Bloodraven saw. Brotherly love. A dance with dragons. The wayward bride. Tell the crow's eye he's afraid of kin slaying, and he'll murder one of his own sons just to prove you wrong. Young people are particularly known for pushing boundaries, seeing what they can get away with, that sort of thing, especially when it comes to authority. Euron did this in a much grander way, where most people would test their parents or other elders. Euron took this idea to the extreme and tested the gods themselves. Yeah, he went right for the biggest taboo of all, kinslaying, and discovered it wasn't real. First, with Harlan Greyjoy. The winds of winter, the forsaken. His eyes grew frantic as he died. They begged me. When the life went out of them, I went out and pissed into the sea, waiting for the god to strike me down. None did. But he also took note of how it bound everyone else around him. Yeah, he's free in ways that others were and are not. And he was just getting started. He tells Aaron that he has killed three of their brothers. And the first two were doomed in any case. One born with a soft skull, the other slowly petrifying from the grayscale. So killing Balon was a lot different in some important ways. But in the eyes of the gods, there's not supposed to be a difference. And Euron would agree with that, sarcastically. <laughs> there was no difference that he killed his brothers. So the Living Ones both plot betrayal against him, and he knows it. He's already captured Aaron and Victarion as well. Doomed, in our opinion, I guess. Part of what allows Euron to anticipate his brother's betrayals is that he knows so keenly why they hate him so much. Victarion's traumatized because he felt he had to beat his own wife to death after Euron slept with her. Yeah, it's pretty ridiculous reasoning, but the bottom line is that Victarion hates his elder brother for that and other reasons. Yeah, a lot of them. <laughs> and we love to compare characters, and Euron compares to quite a few. We've already talked about Viserys, Joffrey, and Ramsay, and they've come up a lot. But these perhaps aren't surprising comparisons, because they're very villainous characters who you can argue have no redeeming qualities. George R. R. Martin likes to give us morally gray characters, but these guys are not great examples of that. In the Forsaken episode, we said there were very few comparisons between Euron and Stannis, but we lied. We found more. When he was in his teens, Stannis initially shunned the gods because they took his mother and father in front of him. Euron doesn't believe in them because he tested them breaking the biggest commandment he could, and he didn't even so much as stub his toe. So nothing in life has changed that initial belief for Euron or for Stannis. Stannis has never seen the power of the Seven in action, for example. Neither of us either, really. Speak for yourself, Aziz. Okay. <laughs> and Euron probably hasn't either, right? <laughs> now, Stannis believes in Melisandre because she's seen real power. He's seen real power from her, and she's seen real power from herself, too. <laughs> and he's more than willing to use it as a means to an end. So like Stannis, Euron has also seen real power out there in the world and wielded some of it himself. So like Stannis, he's more than willing to use it as means to an end also. But unlike Stannis, his introduction to real magic, real power, came much earlier in his life, even if it was only in his dreams. But he did have a head start. Yeah, this is another thing that puts him beyond his brothers. They are superstitious and distrusting of magic while believing in the gods and taboos, like that Kinslayer curse. Aaron and Victarion particularly. Euron, on the other hand, is willing to follow those roads wherever they go, especially if they lead to power. It's a major difference between not just himself and his brothers, but himself and the Ironborn in general, Westeros in general. Yeah, that's right. And it's funny because Euron paints himself as the Storm. And the Storm is, the Storm God is like the, the, antipath the antithesis of Ironborn beliefs. He's the evil guy. And, and Euron is kind of like, won them over despite <laughs> casting himself as an equivalent to the god that's like the most evil thing. He's like their equivalent of Satan. Uh, that's just, he's pulling it off somehow. And the rest of Euron's family, though, what about them? There were probably some uncles and aunts out there and some cousins, almost certainly. We don't really know anything about his mother because she died early in his life. But there's one figure who looms large, literally. He stood about six foot six. Lord Quellon. A feast for crows, the iron captain. In him our father's blood went bad. Our mother's blood as well. Victarion would not speak of kinslaying, here in this godly place beneath the bones of Naga and the Grey King's Hall. But many a night, 
He dreamed of driving a mailed fist into Euron's smiling face until the flesh split and his bad blood ran red and free. I must not. I pledged my word to Balon. Several right on topic points there in that quote. It's a good sampling of Victorian's hate for Euron, powerful as it is. It is not as powerful as his superstitions. Euron doesn't quite terrify him and make him hate that much. It's close, though. <laughs> and this is paired with Aaron and Victorian giving an indication of what they thought of their father and mother. It sounds like they thought well of their parents. <laughs> Lord Kellon was, it may surprise you to hear, quite progressive and sought to reform the Ironborn. He wanted more trade, less reaving, more education, and less dogma. He brought maesters and ravens and ended thraldom. I can imagine someone like Roderick the Reader, or someone old enough to remember Lord Kellon, making a comparison between him and Asha, someone who believed that the Ironborn couldn't just reave for eternity. So Huron must have really hated that. <laughs> <laughs> His son's objections aside, he was quite effective at changing all these long-standing Ironborn traditions and behaviors, in part because he was a strong, tall, loud, proven in battle. He was authoritative and pretty smart, apparently. <laughs> he was not against all their traditions, either. He, his son certainly learned traditional Ironborn things like fighting and sailing and drinking. Balon went reaving as early as age 15, and I imagine Euron was ready to go at a pretty early age too. But it's difficult to imagine what father and son thought of each other. I mean, Lord Kellon is but an outline, and Euron is, well, well, you understand. <laughs> Something that may have been hard for Lord Kellon to miss would be Euron's treatment of his younger brothers. I don't, I don't mean him killing them, because he got away with that and no one found out, but he probably teased them a lot, he's probably you know, t tortured them, not like literal torture in front of their father, but just picking on them really harshly, that kind of stuff. He was probably good at hiding the worst of it, as we said, but Lord Kellon, you know, he didn't know about the rusty hinge, and he probably didn't care so much about teasing Victorian, because Victorian's got Lord Kellon's size, and, you know... Ironborn aren't exactly ones who worry about what people say to each other, unless it's yeah. insulting. You know, you're not supposed to be able to handle words, right? Yeah, he's not going to coddle him. <laughs> exactly. But it looks like Euron went after every single one of them, his younger brothers, that is. And though older brothers tormenting younger brothers is as old as mankind, Euron still may have stood out because he was so extreme. Yeah, if he started rocking the eye patch early on, he <laughs> definitely would have. Here he is in a piece by the Three Hairs tumblr.com sands the beard so we can picture that i mean just picture a little 15 year old Euron putting it on and his father being like what are you doing okay whatever <laughs> emo Euron. <laughs> and he would have stood out in other ways it's unclear who is the best fighter among the sons of lord kellon i would guess victorian but it's very clear who the smartest is not victorian <laughs> and the most handsome and of course i mean Euron. and given how he treated his brothers it's easy to see why they probably hated him then as much as they do, or almost as much as they do now. We could probably say that Euron didn't have a lot in common with his father, and I wonder what Lord Kellon thought of his son in general. Lord Kellon forbade reaving within the Seven Kingdoms, which seems like the kind of thing Euron might disobey, but then again his ship is rather noteworthy and obvious, and while he's crazy and bold, he's certainly not stupid. He may have behaved, and in fact since Lord Kellon was perfectly okay with reaving done far from Westeros, this prohibition may have helped develop Euron's taste for foreign exploration, if he wanted killing and excitement, which, let's be honest, he did, he would have to sail to faraway places. Though Lord Kellon fought in wars in his youth, such as the War of Nine Penny Kings, he was cautious with his people when Robert's Rebellion rolled around. At first, he did not take a side. Clearly, Euron was not far away reaving during all this, given what we know, which is that Balon, Euron, and Victorian convinced their father to join the war. They wanted gold and glory, but they sold it as... We need to be on the winning side, or bad things can happen, we could get punished, etc. So after the death of Prince Rhaegar at the Trident, Lord Kellon relented, sailed south with his longships, attacking the enemies of Half Baratheon. They won some small and easy victories at first. The world of ice and fire. But at the mouth of the Manda, they met unexpected resistance from the Shield Islanders, who sailed forth in their own longships to give battle. A dozen ships were seized and sunk in the fight that followed. And though the Ironborn gave worse than they got, amongst their dead was Lord Quellen Greyjoy. His father's death was the pressing matter of the time, but Euron perhaps noted the tenacity of the Shield Islanders for much later in A Feast for Crows when he captures them. 
Recall that afterwards, Euron gives the Shield Island castles to particular Ironborn that he wants out of the way, knowing that they will be killed while stubbornly trying to hold their new doomed lordships. The New Old Way Balon immediately set out to reverse much of his father's reforms upon taking the Seastone Chair, and went even further, attempting to restore the old way itself. It was kind of the opposite of what his father was doing, really. He was much like his father, except in this. Um, he didn't have the great size and strength, but he did have the ambition to change his people and to be a strong and authoritative and a doer as a leader. Balon also saw the value in things like maesters, so he wasn't totally backwards, but he otherwise did guide the Ironborn backwards. And perhaps Euron was a major supporter or an advisor or encourager of this behavior. Their father's reforms didn't suit either of them, and in an environment of superstition, it's easier to control violent men, and that's opportunity for someone like Euron. But these violent men were Balons, and would be for a while yet. Euron himself was unmarried, while Balon had three sons, Roderick, Maron, and Theon, who at the time would have been about four. Theon, that is. I feel like Roderick should have been Rodron. <laughs> Rodron, yes. <laughs> Euron's ambitions likely were far less grand than they are now, especially because of Balon's sons. I mean, he was many Greyjoys away from the Seastone Chair, and he probably hadn't yet tasted Shade of the Evening, which was a big source of his ambition, as we'll see later. Balon was about to help Euron out with that first problem, though, meaning having a lot of heirs. For Balon to truly bring back the old way, well, there was at least one huge obstacle, which is that the Iron Throne would totally not be okay with such naughty behavior. <laughs> That's against the law. So the Seastone Chair needed to rise up to the Iron Throne's level. Balon's Rebellion. I didn't start right away, of course. They needed time to prepare and plan. Lord Kellon died in 283, roughly, and the Rebellion was roughly launched around 289. Uh, we definitely wonder, in that interim, how much of the planning and general concept of the rebellion itself came from Euron. My guess is, at the very least, Balon wanted independence or liked the idea of it thoroughly, and Euron either pushed it or was the first one to suggest it. And in any case, he would have been eager about the possibility, I think, because he would see many benefits from it. Yeah, exactly. Success would mean that Euron could reeve close to home, no longer beholden to the Iron Throne, and failure might mean the death of Balon or some of his sons, or all of them, and bringing him closer to the Seastone Chair. When the war did come at last, they launched a sneak attack using a plan devised by Euron. The World of Ice and Fire In 289 AC, Lord Balon struck, declaring himself the king of the Iron Islands and dispatching his brothers Euron and Victorian to Lannisport to burn the Lannister fleet. The sea shall be my moat, he declared, as Lord Tywin's ships went up in flames, and woe to any man who dares to cross it. This plan is part of why we suspect Euron was involved in other parts of the planning for the war. This is the only one that's specifically attributed to him, though. The war started well, but Balon made a major miscalculation or three. He understood that his longships were superior in many ways, but in a pitched naval battle, they were not. They'd be no match for the larger warships used by mainlanders. A pitched naval battle was very likely, because Balon knew that they wouldn't go chasing after his longships. They'd come for Pike itself. That was why he built the Iron Fleet, which is more of a traditional war fleet. It has ships that match the size of what the Iron Throne would bring to bear in a war. So Balon... Perhaps, again, with advice from Euron, had that part of the plan pretty well nailed down, but he underestimated how strong Robert Baratheon's authority would be. He thought lords would be slow and stubborn with their support because he's a new king, because the Targaryens had ruled so long, and he was kind of counting on that. He expected that when they did come for him, the invasion fleet wouldn't be as big as it probably turned out to be. Balon needed to prevent that battle with the invasion fleet from ever happening in the first place, or win the battle, if it did happen. And that was why taking out the Lannister fleet was important. Alone, the Lannister fleet's no match for the Greyjoy fleet. But if the Lannister fleet had been allowed to add itself to the royal fleet before that big battle, well, that would have made it a lot harder to win that big battle. So, it worked, but it didn't work. The world of ice and fire. Swift to respond, the young king called his banners and sent his brother Stannis 
Lord of Dragonstone, around dawn with the royal fleet. Warships from Old Town and the Arbor and the Reach joined their strength to his. Balon Greyjoy sent his own brother, Victorian, to meet them, but in the Straits of Fair Isle, Lord Stannis lured the Ironborn into a trap and smashed the Iron Fleet. I mean, I guess if the Lannister fleet had been there to help, Victorian would have lost even worse. <laughs> and though we could say that the new ships were a match for Roberts, Victorian was no match for Stannis, though he did survive, and clearly so did Euron, wherever he was during this engagement. Everything hinged on this battle for Balon, but he didn't bend the knee when he lost. This stubbornness cost him another son. Maron was killed when the castle pike was taken, and soon enough, the war was over, and of course, Theon was made a ward. And the culling of Balon's heirs was good for Euron, obviously. <laughs> Looking back to just before the rebellion, Balon surely knew his brothers well enough by then. He chose Victorian to lead the Iron Fleet at some point prior to the war, not Euron. This is curious. Did he not trust Euron? Well, that could easily be it, and we can easily see why. But it must be something, and it's an interesting decision. I find it hard to believe that Balon earnestly believed that Victorian would be more capable of the two, and indeed he was lured into a trap. I doubt Euron would have been so easy to fool, but this is not nearly the only consideration. Balon may not have wanted to put that much power in his brother's hands. After all, the Iron Fleet is still pretty loyal to Victorian, and later on Euron has to manipulate Victorian to manipulate the Iron Fleet. That may have been what Balon was worried about. But the problem is, Victorian's just not very smart. Balon had to realize that, too. So he went with the dutiful, not smart guy over the clever mm -hmm. guy he can't trust. Then again, for some reason, the Greyjoys attacked Seaguard, which is a place built specifically to defeat and defend against Ironborn. Lord Jason Malister killed Roderick there. This plan was probably not Euron's, unless it was suggested as a way to sabotage his brother, though. Right, maybe Euron was like, hmm, here's a good way to get rid of one of Balon's sons. Let's <laughs> get them to attack Seaguard, this place that's really hard to take. It seems a little transparent, though. Yeah, it would be a little too obvious, maybe. But Balon did it, so <laughs> whatever the, de the decision was, whatever they made that decision, it wasn't smart. <laughs> Which is why maybe we can consider a little conspiratorial thinking. In any way, the Ironborn do not lack for skill at sea, or at arms nor do they lack courage. Even people who despise the Ironborn admit that much. But they lack good commanders, which is another reason why Balon choosing Victorian is a little odd. In modern terms, you could say that they had a weak officer corps, right? It was a problem for Balon. He still didn't use Euron. It was Euron's one of his, probably his smartest commander, subcommander, if he had chosen to use him, but he didn't. So I wonder, is this going to be a weakness for Euron in current times? Because, again... He's got to make all these decisions, and he can't rely that much on his subcommanders because they don't have a great batch of subcommanders to choose from. Right now, Euron is doing pretty well because he's running a tight... <laughs> no, no, I won't go there. But we'll see if he has to start spreading himself out more. If he's delegating to his subordinates, it might not work as well. Euron's role in the rest of Balon's rebellion is unclear. Was he at Pike when the tower collapsed on Maron? Since he didn't lead the fleet, perhaps he conducted raids, kind of maybe like what Theon was doing. And if being at sea allowed him to avoid the worst at the of the end of the rebellion, well, that would help. Our helper Rhaenys suggests Euron could have been sent to recover Balon's heir Roderick's men after he was killed at Seagar, kind of get you know get them all back together and bring them back to Pike to rejoin the army, something like that. And in picturing these scenarios. I wonder if Euron's ship had its signature look by then, which leads us to the similar question of, did Euron himself have his signature look by then? When did this happen? Yeah. You know, this signature look that you can see here on the screen, art by dejin delicdeviantartcom I mean, he's just flamboyant. Yeah, <laughs> it's really uh, different. I mean, Victorian probably had his Kraken helm and his fierce look, and the Ironborn under Euron now are starting to show... Some of that so-called rude splendor because they've taken a lot of loot. They've been successful under Euron so far. And think of the Golden Company, like how they wear a lot of their wealth on them as a display to show, you know, how successful they are, to show who they've killed and, and to show that they're skilled, experienced warriors. But at the outset of A Song of Ice and Fire, they're portrayed for the most part as fierce but shabby. It's a poor culture, and this is important to the story. It's part of how they're manipulated. 
And if you've seen their portrayals on HBO, this point is communicated pretty well. They are rather unadorned. Where, whereas most of Westeros on TV is really the detail, the, the armor, mm -hmm. the, the, the sigils and everything is really well made and detailed. Ironborn are all, they're just shabby. <laughs> yeah, however, Euron, book Euron that is, is definitely up there with Dario in terms of flashiness. Nowadays, Euron has a reputation that spans the seas, apparently, and that's what terrifies people, that's what people remember. But before he had that reputation, before he could earn the fear of so many, he got a head start. He stood out because of the steps he took to, well, stand out. <laughs> Again, look at him here serving those looks. Looking like a rock star in this piece by Archer Mosca, mosco.artstation.com. So let's look at how Euron took these steps to stand out. A perfect time for a shout out to those of our Patreon supporters who are Ironborn Captains, including Kathleen the Ruthless, Captain of the Night Terror, Black Matto Stormrider, Captain of the Rusted Hinge, Rebea, Lady of Waves, Captain of the Iron Shadowcat, Tusk Shield, Breaker Captain of Kraken's Fury, Oisin the Wanderer, Captain of Naga's Living Flame, and Sir Rel... And Sir Selvus Redblade of White Harbor, Captain of Trident of the North. Silence. Silence. Was that a long enough silence? Oh, wait, he meant the ship. <laughs> yeah, the ship. What, what was that? <laughs> a feast for crows, the Iron Captain. And then he saw her, a single-masted galley, lean and low, with a dark red hull. Her sails, now furled, were black as a starless sky. Even at anchor, silence looked both cruel and fast. On her prow was a black iron maiden with one arm outstretched. Her waist was slender, her breasts high and proud, her legs long and shapely. A wind-blown mane of black iron hair streamed from her head, and her eyes were mother of pearl. But she had no mouth. Yaron is a great example of the power of reputation, striking fear into a foe well in advance of any actual battle. Part of that reputation he earned, but like she said, he kick-started it with his look. Got him kind of going quickly there. And it's, that starts with his ship. Because when you're a pirate, people see your ship before they see you, right? <laughs> so if Silence was raiding during Balon's Rebellion, picture that. People would remember it. Davos paints his ship black for smuggling, and the Bravosi and Lyseni like their ships to stand out. You know, purple hulls and sails. You got striped hulls for the Lyseni. But we don't hear a lot of other... A lot of other flashy ships coming from Westeros, right? They they have their sigils and stuff like that. But stuff like this, well, Euron's done. We don't have a lot of examples of that. Other than custom figureheads on the Ironborn ships. That's really about it. Mm -hmm. So a red-hulled ship with black sails seen off the western shores? People would remember that. And for those who saw that ship, some would live to talk about it. So over time, that legend would grow. I mean, that's what Euron wants. Eventually, men who don't even know each other in seaside taverns would hear each other talking about the silence. Like, hey, I've seen that red hulled ship too, huh? <laughs> and again, that's exactly what Euron wants. He wants people talking about him. And some few of those telling these tales of Euron would have actually seen him up close. And this is what, or near to what, they would have seen. A feast for crows, the Iron Captain. Euron was the most comely of Lord Quellon's sons. And three years of exile had not changed that. His hair was still black as a midnight sea, with never a white cap to be seen, and his face was still smooth and pale beneath his neat dark beard. A black leather patch covered Euron's left eye, but his right was blue as a summer sky. The lack of white hair on Euron is noteworthy because Victorian is younger than him, but he has hair flecked with hoarfrost. But we don't exactly have ages for either of them, or an age gap, so it's hard to say exactly how outstanding his lack of aging is. Victorian seems a little surprised, but not alarmed. It's only been three years, after all. He wouldn't have been expected to age all that much anyway. Yeah, so I don't think there's any magic involved here, but it does kind of hint at something, maybe. The blue eye, of course, is also outstanding. We don't hear a lot of blue-eyed ironborn. That's not a thing we've heard mentioned much at all, or at all, period. Regarding his other eye, as we know, nothing is actually wrong with it. We talked about his eye a good bit in The Forsaken. But eye patches, that's when I talk about something new here, are not just some sort of silly affectation from pirate movies. You know, they're, they actually serve a real purpose. Think of how your eyes adjust when you go from bright light to darkness. Sometimes it takes a while, right? Like, it's, it's kind of disorienting sometimes. At first, everything is pitch black, then 
slowly things kind of take shape. The opposite is arguably worse. When you go from sudden light to darkness, it can be uncomfortable or painful. Either way, it takes time, right? That's the point. It has to, your eyes have to adjust. So if you have an eye patch over one eye, that eye is constantly dark adjusted. So you go from above deck to below decks, you switch the eye patch over, and you can see because that eye is already ready for the darkness. It sounds maybe a little far-fetched, but the FAA even recommends that, quote, a pilot should close one eye when using a light to preserve some degree of night vision. The Ironborn are masters of the sea. We all know this, but Euron is a cut above. His eye patch is symbolic of this. It helps his reputation, makes him look scary, and has a practical purpose few are aware of. Euron will eventually, as we see in the current storyline, amplify his appearance and reputation through both magical and quasi-magical means. This effect is amplified, as is the name of the ship itself, by his crew. A feast for crows, the iron captain. The men upon the shore had spied their sails. Shouts echoed across the bay as friends and kin called out greetings, but not from silence. On her decks, a motley crew of mutes and mongrels spoke no word as the iron victory drew nigh. Men black as tar stared out at him, and others squat and hairy as the apes of Sothorius. Monsters, Victorian thought. Now that's creepy. You're sailing up and there's all these other ships and everyone is yelling greetings, except this one ship where they're just staring at you. Not a sound. And knowing the reason why they don't speak, the fact that many of their tongues are cut out has got to make this effect even creepier. It's not entirely clear how much of this crew is new since his exile, but I would assume quite a few. Certainly his three sons are too old to have been from his most recent exile. And, though we haven't seen it yet, and it may be something that adds to his brother's general unease, Euron apparently has a quick temper if we're interpreting this correctly. A feast for crows, the Iron Captain. Do you accuse me? Euron asked mildly. Should I? The sharpness in Asher's voice made Victorian frown. It was dangerous to speak so to the crow's eye, even when his smiling eye was shining with amusement. Dangerous, he says. Acting rashly due to losing his temper and making a mistake could be in Euron's future. Something will be his undoing eventually, I guess. I don't suppose he's going to be left standing at the end of the series. Well, we could be wrong, but if, if he if something takes him out, maybe this will lead to it. You could argue that sleeping with Victorian's wife was a mistake too, though it kind of worked out for him. It's not in the way he expected though. Let's take a look. Exile. Balon's rebellion ended in 290, and about seven years later, that's when Euron was exiled for sleeping with Victorian's wife and possibly getting her pregnant. Euron claims Victorian's wife is the one who initiated it and says it right to Vic's face. And Vic doesn't deny it, but he wasn't there. I mean, Euron could easily be lying just you know, psychological torment is something he's a fan of. He really enjoys torturing his brothers, so that's nothing new. It's a good example of Euron pushing the limits, though. In a fight, I would take Victorian over Euron, but Euron knows how superstitious and dutiful his brother is. Vic won't kinslay, and Balon won't let him kinslay, and Euron knows that. But Euron didn't expect to be exiled, we could guess, so while he figured out how far his brother would go, which is not far enough, he maybe didn't account for this possibility. He yeah. maybe underestimated Balon. Yeah, I wonder if it wasn't just this incident, maybe. Not that it wasn't enough, but perhaps this was the straw that broke the camel's back. The Kraken's back. <laughs> Balon may have been glad to have a good excuse to get rid of his dangerous brother. I would be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, something I touched on briefly before, it's interesting that Victorian had a wife and that Euron did not. It's interesting because these things are usually up to the Lord, right? Balon maybe had Victorian Mary, but Vic's elder Euron, he did not. And we can assume maybe there was a bit of a problem there for whoever Victorian's wife's family was. Maybe that's part of why they kept it quiet. But in any case, Euron doesn't seem like the type to kind of grouse and complain like, say, Stannis, another middle child. <laughs> but as a middle brother getting passed over for a younger, especially one less capable... Euron might have been bothered about the Iron Fleet thing, and maybe not so much about not getting a wife. He may have harbored some resentment. <laughs> oh, psychonautical humor there for you. <laughs> Balon clearly had his reasons, whatever they were, and it's not hard to see what they might have been, right? Would you have favored Euron over Victorian? 
<laughs> again, it comes down to Victorian being trustworthy. Euron, very much not. So Balon probably knew this earlier than most of the rest of the world, being his older brother and all. It's interesting, though. Few people in the story know what happened. Yeah. Balon seemed to have kept it quiet. Asha, for instance, clearly doesn't know the gossip, as we can see here. A feast for crows, the Iron Captain. Why did Euron go away so suddenly? The crow's eye oft went reaving. Never for so long. He took the silence east, a lengthy voyage. So Asha doesn't even know he's been exiled, let alone why, though she guesses that Euron killed Victorian's wife. Which isn't a bad guess, <laughs> but it's not the truth. Yeah. And there's also some insight here to be gained, though, about Euron's history with regards to the east. One thing we've been trying to figure out with our research was just how much time he spent over there and where he might have gone, how long how long a time he would spend over there each time. So this was a clue that the exile was longer than any of his other voyages. Asha says he's never been gone this long. So that implies shorter voyages prior to that. So being exiled meant Euron couldn't just loot, take a few ships, and then run home. He had to do it differently. It's also kind of funny, in a not ha-ha funny, but ironic maybe, or just weird <laughs> to think that the incident with Victorian's unnamed wife was actually the catalyst for this huge story element with Euron. The East is where Euron learns about who he really wants to be. It's a voyage of self-discovery for the plucky pirate. Gives him a lot of street sea cred. <laughs> I am Balon's brother, Kellon's eldest living son. Lord Vicon's blood is in my veins and the blood of the old Kraken. Yet I have sailed farther than any of them. Only one living Kraken has never known defeat. Only one has never bent his knee. Only one has sailed to Ashai by the shadow and seen wonders and terrors beyond imagining. So circling back to Theon, who was either aware of Euron's reputation for world travel from a young age, or somehow heard it while he was living at Winterfell. Because as we saw earlier, Theon is the first one to think of him. It's Euron's first mention. Yeah, so while most of the important parts of Euron's character, the artifacts and the delusions of grandeur, the blue lips, and probably the mute crew, all seem to come from his exile, he was clearly known before that too. Right, because, I mean, let's be honest, two to three years in exile probably isn't enough to become infamous in so many places all around the world, and... Theon is aware of this before the exile, because he doesn't have details of what happened during the exile. So, on the other hand, though, Euron has never been mentioned in any of the places Daenerys has been, for example, and he's supposedly known in that area. So maybe he's known, but maybe not as known as he wants people to think. All of this is why we need to remember that a lot of Euron's reputation in distant lands is, well, a claim made by Euron himself. Theon thinks that it was said about him, and Euron's great at manipulating perception to gain power. That's going to be a theme in this episode for sure, but he's also clearly not a complete fraud. Some of his magical connections and artifacts are real. For example, he really did capture the ship Pyat Pri and his fellow warlocks were using to go after Daenerys, which does prove that he was in the vicinity of west of Karth. Now, think about that for a minute, though. I wonder... Did the warlocks know who they were dealing with beforehand when they saw his sails? You know, hmm. when men see my sails, they pray. <laughs> were these warlocks among them? Perhaps they did not because, you know, they're warlocks and they spent all their time in the, you know, with the, in the house of the undying far from the sea. They but, freed. <laughs> but some of the sailors on their ship may have known exactly who that was, and it may have terrified them, and that may have meant that the ship was just easier to capture because they were afraid before they even came to grips. The Forsaken shows the awful shape that these warlocks are in now. There's only two left at this point, though in Feast, there were three, and of course, the th those three were forced to eat the fourth, and now those two are tied to ship prows, so... Things aren't exactly looking up for them, unless you consider that they'll be dead soon, which will at least mean the end of their torments. Mm. <laughs> but the value of being feared before you're ever seen, this is such a huge concept for Euron, and it's on display here, kind of on a meta level. Early on, he's mentioned in some crucial spots, but that's just it. He's just mentioned, described from afar. So the reader is getting that same impression from afar about Euron before we actually meet him. Also, though, his crew of mutes in many cases, appear to be slaves. And slaves are not exactly allowed in Westeros. 
So that's part of the value of him getting the Iron Islands independent again. Yeah, and obviously the slaves can't exactly talk to anyone about how they're slaved. <laughs> Not unlike the servants at Illyrio's manse, for example, who Tyrion thinks are basically slaves despite it being outlawed in Pentos. They might have their tongues cut, retired little birds, we'd say, and it's a great parallel, except for how awful it is. An awful parallel. <laughs> An awfully great parallel. Mm. Avaris and Illyrio are wrong for doing this, and Euron is right. They're with them. <laughs> In both cases, there's a method to this maiming, though. For Varus and Illyrio, it seems to be pretty simple. They want to keep secrets, right? For Euron, it's that, but more. It's not just that. A Storm of Swords, Davos V. A certain Lysine pirate once told me that a good smuggler stays out of sight, Davos replied carefully. Black sails, muffled oars, and a crew that knows how to hold their tongues. The Lysini laughed. A crew with no tongues is even better. Big, strong mutes who cannot read or write. Big, strong mutes who cannot read or write, you say? <laughs> That's exactly what Euron has aboard his ship. How about that? Hmm. Again, note the similarity to little birds, except for the little part. These are big, strong birds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're with yellow feathers and on Sesame Street. That's where Euron goes <laughs> reaving. <laughs> You're going to find that he has Grover and... Kermit down there, too. Well, we already got Elmo in the Riverlands. <laughs> That's right. This is getting more and more terrifying as we go on. In some ways, though, the tongue cutting is very different from the little bird thing. Euron's reputation is important, as we've shown. He wants to be known. Varus and Illyrio prefer to work in the shadows. They do not want to be known. We've also shown that given that Euron knows his reputation is important, he is wont to exaggerate or straight up lie. And it's been hinted at how he's perceived might be a weakness. A feast for crows, the reaver. Have you forgotten? I have sailed the smoking sea and seen Valyria. Have you? The reader asked, so softly. Euron's blue smile vanished. Reader, he said into the quiet. You would do well to keep your nose in your books. It's easy to miss that this is a rare thing, to see Euron not smug and calm and casual, but there it is. Yeah, Euron would certainly lose some gravitas if it was known that some of his tales of world travel were invented. Readers and Ironborn are both impressed by how far he's traveled. Well, Roderick the Reader isn't, but <laughs> it would Not definitely undermine some of his authority if he were out it, for sure. Yeah, and pray recall this bit of wisdom from Tyrion on tongue cutting. Uh, no, we're not trying to bring that up again. It just, it's part of the subject matter here. Yeah, we'll hold our tongues. <laughs> A Clash of Kings, Tyrion Three. When you tear out a man's tongue, you are not proving him a liar. You're only telling the world that you fear what he might say. By that logic, Euron must be terrified of what people will say about him because he's cut out so many tongues. I mean, he has that line in the Forsaken and he says to Aaron about, if I had a tongue for every time someone threatened me, like you do have a tongue for all that, yeah. I'm glad he doesn't have a cloak of tongues. Yeah. He might. He just hasn't pulled it out yet. You know, he's just keeping it to keeping it in the back. It's got a cure first. All that tongue leather takes a while to dry out. Eef. But seriously, about these tongues, it's important because not everyone has their tongue cut out, and especially his three sons. That I think could really matter. Euron compares his sons, when speaking to Victorian, to the contents of his chamber pot. He doesn't seem to think too much of them, and it's possible they know too much. I mean, let's say he's been to Valyria, then they would be able to verify that, which would be fine, because that's if it's true, then he would want witnesses. But it's probably not true, and they almost certainly know that, and thus they could out him. Yeah, in any case, they are perhaps among the few, if not the only ones, who know a lot of these truths. That alone might make their lives very short. It definitely depends on how much Euron trusts them and how much harm these sons can do with their secrets. One could turn on him, and it wouldn't surprise us at all. After all, you can only imagine what he did to their respective mothers. Right, that would be a good cause for revenge, right? You know? <laughs> uh, and what if some of them, one of them, say, winds up a captive, of like Daenerys? And I mentioned Daenerys specifically because you're on Daenerys, you're clearly going to go you know, head-to-head -head in some way or another. And she's apparently the slayer of lies. So you're on, and a lot of lies built up around him. Uh, we do expect her to slay the lie that is young Griff, you know, Fagon, Aegon VI, but that's still only one lie, right? Uh, he's got other lies to slay, I would think, and Euron's a great candidate. 
Yeah, but even if that is true, there is so much that Euron can do first, and just like Aegon might be a fake, the best ideas that we have suggest that either way, he's got special lineage. And, for instance, Aegon really took Storm's End. And, similarly, much of what Euron has done is not a lie. He really did hire a faceless man to kill his brother, and he really has Valyrian steel armor. So let's go onward. From Ib to Ashai, a feast for crows, the Iron Captain. Who knows more of gods than I? Horse gods and fire gods, gods made of gold with gemstone eyes, gods carved of cedar wood, gods chiseled into mountains, gods of empty air. I know them all. I have seen their peoples garland them with flowers and shed the blood of goats and bulls and children in their names. And I have heard the prayers in half a hundred tongues. Cure my withered leg, make the maiden love me, grant me a healthy son, save me, succor me, make me wealthy, protect me, protect me from mine enemies, protect me from the darkness, protect me from the crabs inside my belly, from the horse lords, from the slavers, from the cell swords at my door, protect me from the silence. <laughs> Godless. Why, Aaron, I am the godliest man to ever raise sail. You serve one god, Damper, but I have served ten thousand. From Ib to Ashai, when men see my sails, they pray. So that's probably his most famous quote, right? It's yeah. both badass and terrifying and just kind of like, whoa, this story I'm reading, it's really something, really serious. So while it's important to realize that Euron lies, he isn't lying about everything. It's not even close. The majority of his exploits seem to be real enough. I mean, we spent some time tearing him down, but we're going to set the record straight because he did, after all, for example, have a huge amount of loot for the king's moot. That didn't come from nowhere. And the amazing artifacts he has, the shark tooth crown and obviously the Valyrian steel armor and all these other stuff. Some of these things may be legitimately magical. Some of them may play an important role in the story to come. But it was the shade of the evening that has set the stage for all the rest, really. As the relics he's collected enable him to pursue his goal, it was the wine of the warlocks that opened his mind to the, the possibilities of these goals in the first place. He captured Pyat Pri's galley and his three other warlocks, and this chance encounter has massive ramifications, because not only does Euron learn about the existence of Danny's dragons, which is huge by itself, he also gets that cask of Shade of the Evening from them, and he really likes it, as his lips seem to prove. Yeah, psychedelic drugs have a history in real life too, so why not Essos, yeah. of helping people find purpose in life. Or in Euron's case, unlocking vast subconscious ambitions of world domination, or something along those lines. I mean, <laughs> who hasn't had a trip where they just dreamed of taking over the world? <laughs> and destroying all the gods, and yeah, I have that dream it's every typical. day. Hmm. When Euron was exiled, he was a famous pirate at best. When he returned from exile, he was a man on a mission. I like to think that the shade of the evening is what kind of set him towards this great goal, and the artifacts he's collected enable him to do it. Try to imagine what Euron saw that first time. Well, you probably can. None of us can. But the first time he had shade of the evening, it was probably like a dark revelation of kinds. I wonder if it inspired him to consider the inaction of the gods more deeply, something he had already thought about before. Or did he realize that he had this horn and this dragon's egg and knowledge that faceless men existed and the location of some dragons and he tripped and put it all together? Or did he just relive the experiences from his youth that may have, say, been Blood Raven's eye on him? Maybe he was able to relive those memories and they had new meaning this time around. Maybe he saw bits and pieces of the future. Maybe he saw the long night coming. Maybe he saw the others. No matter what he saw, either way, I imagine he loved it right away, <laughs> and that matters a lot. There's a huge difference in experience when you want to do a psychedelic drug versus when you do not. <laughs> On one end of the spectrum here, we have the damp hair who had it literally jammed down his throat, and in the middle we have Daenerys who was like, Okay, yeah, I'm seeking wisdom here, so I'll try this out. But on the other end, we have Euron, who is just all about the vision. <laughs> yeah. Wonder what'll happen if he runs out. Plot <laughs> twist, he starts to have withdrawal. <laughs> but fear for those around him if that happens. Uh, Euron with withdrawal symptoms would probably be, oof, pretty bad. <laughs> Maybe we're overstating it, but I love the idea that a drug he found on the other side of the world after being exiled because he slept with his brother's wife led to him aiming to be king of all Westeros, right? <laughs> the question then becomes, among others, is he skilled enough to pull it off? 
If we could see every moment in Neuron's life somehow, we'd find a time when killing Balin and taking over the Iron Islands, and then Westeros, was just an idea. Back to his wealth for a minute, though. I think it's an interesting consideration. Put a few things together here. The Faceless Men charge a lot, right? A substantial portion of your wealth relative to what you have. That's what we're told. So, well, Euron, after having Balon killed, showed up to the King's Moot with a truly staggering amount of wealth to give away. So that implies that he just had a really insane amount before paying the Faceless Men, or... That dragon's egg was just that valuable to them, or there's something else going on, and maybe they have a working arrangement. Any case, well, he still has Valerian Steel Armor and Dragon Binder, right? Those are worth a ton. So, like, I it just I don't see how he could have given them a percentage of his wealth, not a big percentage of his wealth. So that's why there's some crackpot theories revolving around Euron and this transaction to kill Balon. You can see why not everything quite adds up the way we expect it to. Not in a way that doesn't work, but in a way that implies there's mystery. The best idea seems to be the dragon's egg still, that it was sufficient payment. That seems to be the simplest answer, and it fits pretty well, and it is given to us by Euron's own comment about throwing it into the sea. Because Balon was thrown into the sea. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, that's one of the theories that I just take is like, yeah, that's what happened. Yeah. But it is perhaps puzzling that the Faceless Men would work with Euron at all. He's a slaver and he has designs on being a dragon rider. Right? They hate both slavery and dragons. Right? Yeah. So how does that work? <laughs> Later, we're going to consider Old Town. But while we're on the topic of Faceless Men, it's noteworthy that there's one in the Citadel right now. And Euron is about to attack Perhaps take Old Town, we think. So, how do those, do those things work together? Is the Faceless Man being there? Is that some sort of arrangement? I don't think so, but it's worth talking about. And it shows us how many cool possibilities there are. There's just so many. The other thing about all that wealth is that it shows his skills as a pirate. He's captured a lot of ships, it seems. He doesn't need to exaggerate that one bit. Given his skills on display in the taking of the shields, it seems like we're going to see some clever moves from him in the future. Yeah, I mean, compared to the way he took the Iron Islands themselves, it's simple by comparison, but still interesting. No king but from the king's moot. It's really not hard to see why Euron came out on top of the king's moot, looking back on it, right? The Ironborn respects strength, and he had already successfully seized the chair by force before this obscure technicality was raised by someone else powerful. But he also simply bested everyone there. It was no contest... Really. Victorian is dependable, but everyone knows he's not very bright. Asha had a clever speech, but ultimately Euron just dominated the whole scene. Beyond cunning, beyond the advantages he gains by having no qualms or superstitions, beyond his ability to read people, beyond simple raw intelligence, Euron also has charisma. He was just a better speaker than all of them, even though Asha was a good speaker too. Victorian wasn't. <laughs> And he's also good-looking and experienced, and so all those things combined got him elected, plus all that crazy loot we keep coming back to. A feast for crows, the reaver. Euron had seduced them with his glib tongue and smiling eye, and bound them to his course with the plunder of half a hundred distant lands, gold and silver, ornate armor, curved swords with gilded pommels, daggers of Illyrian steel, striped tiger pelts, and the skins of spotted cats, jade manticores, and ancient Valyrian sphinxes. And Dragonbinder itself was part of his entrance, giving a literally painful earful to indicate his power. Upon winning, he took a new sigil, matching the color of his ship, which was a red eye with a black pupil beneath an iron crown supported by two crows. You can see this in this piece by Yvonne, who's at Drafturgy on Twitter, which has the horn depicted as well. And you can see the sigil up above, which is just a really cool looking sigil, honestly. Yeah, it's more like a lifelike version of it. And so Euron took this new sigil and went to war right away. Yeah, he goes to war so quickly that Westeros in general doesn't even know he's king yet. His ships just start appearing all over the place. Yeah, we see this from Sam's point of view, as he also doesn't know who this is yet, and neither do those on the ship that he comes in on. Neither do officials and guardsmen at Old Town itself. It's a new sigil, and people just aren't used to it yet. But... Red and black, mm. the inverse of Danny's black and red, kind of reminds you of Blackfires and Targaryens a little bit. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Euron doesn't have any dragon blood in him like the Blackfires did, but if the horn works, he'll actually have a dragon where the Blackfires didn't, <laughs> and that's probably worth more. And unlike any Blackfire to date, he's actually taken a throne. 
in two different ways, by force and then by acclaim. Right. The former is the assassination of Balon, widely believed, since we're of the opinion that Euron paid the faceless men with dragon's egg and possibly more for this. Well, clearly questions still remain about the circumstances, as we've said, of Euron's transaction. But the bottom line is clear enough. Euron King. Well, not yet. <laughs> Euron gets in there and, well, all he really does is delay Euron's ascension. But the process is really fun to read about and likewise to talk about right here. Yeah, that's right. With the sea stone chair, dragon binder, possibly other horns or means to summon krakens, his armor, his crowns, his ambitions, he's ready to go for the Iron Throne itself. His full plan is clear... Though certain aspects are not, sort of. Above the game of thrones, a clash of kings, Tyrion won. In a room sit three great men, a king, a priest, and a rich man with his gold. Between them stands a sellsword, a little man of common birth and no great mind. Each of the great ones bids him slay the other two. Do it, says the king, for I am your lawful ruler. Do it, says the priest, for I command you in the names of the gods. Do it, says the rich man, and all this gold shall be yours. So tell me, who lives and who dies? Varys' riddle is a wonderful feature of A Clash of Kings because it encapsulates the themes of that book so well. As the War of Five Kings rages, it purports to show that power lies where men believe it does, as so many of them have a choice at that point. Euron understands this concept quite well, though despite understanding it, I don't think he would agree with what this riddle uh, tells us. Not fully, anyway. Because Euron, like Danny, destroys the notion that power is a matter of belief by having things that are not a matter of belief. I mean, if he can actually summon storms, or krakens, or bind dragons and warlocks to his will, you can't just deny the, the reality of that. If he's really using blood magic and stuff like that, you can't doubt that his powers are real. So he would answer this riddle by enslaving all four of them, including the Riddler, for good measure. <laughs> no, he'd just take the Riddler's tongue out. <laughs> yeah, no more riddles for you. <laughs> In many ways, he is simply above the Game of Thrones, or at least he aims to be. He aspires to be on a plane of existence where politics are a secondary consideration at best. With her dragons, perhaps only Daenerys is playing on this level with him, Again, that is part of the point from a story perspective, to have a character who is a worthy adversary to the Dragon Queen. Early in A Song of Ice and Fire, there's a lot of intrigue, there's cloak and dagger, then there gradually we get to open fighting, then open warfare. This works really well for Euron, because while he's highly intelligent and adaptable, he's not really that kind of player. He doesn't wheel and deal and rise to power slowly, he seizes it quickly. Seastone Chair is a perfect example. This is a part of the Game of Thrones he's comfortable with. Assassinations. But that method isn't going to do him any good, not much good anyway, outside the Iron Islands where his Greyjoy blood just doesn't count for nearly as much. He at least had a lawful claim for his Driftwood crown once Balin was out of the way. But, you know, killing Tommen, that's not going to do anything for him, really. With regards to his rights elsewhere, well, Tywin explained it when Balon made his move. A Storm of Swords, Tyrion III. He ought to be offering fealty, snapped Cersei. By what right does he call himself king? By right of conquest, Lord Tywin said. Of course, Euron is aiming much higher than his brother. Balon broke free, took the north, and offered to ally with the Iron Throne from a position of strength. Euron doesn't seem like the allying type unless it's a plan to later betray the ally. So he's going to have to do quite a lot more conquering. Euron at war. While Cersei was stubbornly refusing to acknowledge that Balon had become a king, Tywin was already referring to him by that title. This isn't mere formality. Again, Tywin explains how things work. A Storm of Swords, Tyrion III. King Balon's longships command the Sunset Sea and are well placed to menace Lannisport, Fair Isle, and even Highgarden, should we provoke him. The Ironborn have been able to dominate the Western Shores in the past, and there's no reason they can't do so again. Euron seems aware of this, as Tywin is. He's also aware that they are better at taking than holding. Better on the attack than on the defense. Tywin knew all that as well. But Cersei is kind of in charge now, and she is taking the Ironborn too lightly. She doesn't underestimate them like Tywin does, so that could be problematic. We'll see. 
As Euron did when planning to burn the ships at Lannisport for his brother's rebellion, he realized that the Ironborn's ability to conduct sneak attacks was one of their most valuable assets. But the way he did it made it seem like sorcery to even experienced seamen, as we see here. A feast for crows, the reaver. The Ironborn had come in on the evening tide, so the glare of the setting sun would keep them hidden from the greybeards in the watchtowers until it was too late. The wind was at their backs, and it had been all the way down from Old Wick. It was whispered about the fleet that Euron's wizards had much and more to do with that, that the crow's eye appeased the storm god with blood sacrifice. How else would he have dared to sail so far to the west instead of following the shoreline, as was the custom? So this is more of what Euron wants, people talking about him in fear. Odd whispers. This is exactly what he wants. The storm god. Blood sacrifice? What magic did he use? But really, this isn't sorcery at all. It was advanced seamanship, we're pretty sure. He just knew how to do things better, and it looks like magic. More on the relationship between cleverness appearing to be magic later. It's a big topic, but we've got to stay where we are right now. Yeah, now as fun as it is to look at who Euron has attacked so far, who he hasn't attacked is telling as well. It was Euron's plan to burn the Lannister fleet when his brother led the Ironborn towards independence, but Euron didn't bother with him this time. Yeah, that's interesting, right? As we said before, one of Balon's mistakes was misunderstanding where the threats were. If you only get one or two chances to use a trick before everyone wises up, if you only have a few chances to make a surprise attack before everyone is on guard, you have to spend those chances wisely. Balon used his unwisely. Victarion's wisdom... No, no. <laughs> no, that's really a thing. Victarion's wisdom <laughs> explains it. A feast for crows, the Iron Captain. Every man should lose a battle in his youth, so he does not lose a war when he is old. True, but... What Victorian misses, perhaps, is that you can learn from other people's mistakes, too. You don't have to personally make those mistakes to learn from them, especially if you're there to see them. Euron had the opportunity to learn from his father and his brothers, including their mistakes. And he also knows what George R. R. Martin himself tells us right here. So spake Martin. As far as naval power goes, the only fleets comparable to that of the Greyjoys are the Royal Fleet, most of it destroyed on the Blackwater and the Red Wine fleet, based on the Arbor. Besides the King, the Greyjoys and Red Wines are the traditional sea powers of Westeros. The lords whose lands abut the coast of the Sunset Sea all keep a war galley or three about for coastal defence, and of course, those shores are home to scads of fishing boats as well. The Lannisters have a larger and much grander fleet, but we're still only talking about twenty to thirty ships, perhaps. To fight a major battle, they would call the ships of their various bannermen, just as Stannis summoned the lords of the Narrow Sea for the Battle of the Blackwater. That explains a lot, right? Euron isn't really worried about 20 to 30 Lannister ships. He's worried, well, not worried, shall we say. He's planning to deal with the real challenge to their supremacy. Yeah, it's kind of amazing that Euron is so confident in victory against these larger ships that he doesn't have his larger ships with him. The Iron Fleet is in Slaver's Bay. Just let that sink in real quick. He knows that he's going to fight a large fleet, and he sends his best and biggest warships to the other side of the world. This is why, or a part of why, we feel really strongly that magic, especially magic that involves Krakens, is mm -hmm. going to be in play here. Buy stock in <laughs> Kraken Inc. And definitely sell your red wine shares before it's too late. They're doing quite well before any major battles occur, and without the Iron Fleet, though. A feast for crows, Samwell V. The Iron Men had penetrated even to the sheltered waters of whispering sound. Come morning, as the cinnamon wind continued on toward Old Town, she began to bump up against corpses drifting down to the sea. Some of the bodies carried compliments of crows, who rose into the air, complaining noisily when the swan ship disturbed their grotesquely swollen rafts. Scorched fields and burned villages appeared on the banks, and the shallows and sandbars were strewn with shattered ships. Merchanters and fishing boats were the most common, but they saw abandoned longships too, and the wreckage of two big drummonds. One had been burned down to the waterline, whilst the other had a gaping splintered hole in her side where her hull had been rammed. 
Battle here, said Zahondo. Not so long. Who would be so mad as to raid this close to Old Town? Mad indeed. That choice of words is perhaps intentional. Baylor Blacktide said it well here. Balon was mad, Aaron is madder, and Euron is maddest of them all. Yeah, George loves both language. I think he used the word mad on purpose there. I mean, <laughs> instead of like insane or who would be so bold, something like that. He's Queer. very, very specific. And that phrase from Baylor Blacktide lingers in Victorian's mind. He repeats it later in his head at least twice. Probably because of how accurate it is. But the attack on Old Town is perhaps not so mad. It maybe only seems that way. I actually think he's probably going to succeed. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. It seems likely. It certainly makes sense in terms of accomplishing his goals, at least in some tangible ways that are apparent. Let's take a look. For example, Euron, when he brought forward his plan to fetch the dragons, the Ironborn weren't really excited about that. They were more excited about the arbor and, you know, grapes and lower hanging fruit, easier stuff. His men wanted the easy pickings. So he changed his plan and sent Victarion east instead of taking all his men there on his, on his own. He had he, to pivot. Right. Pivot. That's pivot. pivot. <laughs> so he knows he needs to keep his men happy, right? That was important. That's simple enough because keeping them happy is just a matter of winning loot. They're not hard to please. Earlier I compared the Ironborn to sell swords, and this is a good time to remember that. Whoever is leading the Ironborn to loot, that's the one who's going to have their loyalty. So that's why it was important for Euron to be the one guiding them around Old Town and through all these raids while Victorian goes and handles this dangerous job that's a lot less thanks are going to be waiting for him. And Old Town is perfect for all these plans because Old Town is perfect, right? It's huge. It's a major city, strategically important for a would-be king. That's all really easy to see, but there's also this satiating amount of wealth, even for greedy Ironborn. There's a lot of money there. Yeah, but he can't just go right for it. We saw the sneaky attempts in the Forsaken and talked about the foreshadowing for it. In case the sneak attacks don't work, and they haven't, and he probably didn't expect them to, he's been taking the surrounding area. He's especially focused on the arbor, in particular the smaller islands around it, because they're particularly helpless. Euron can take an island, do whatever he wants there for a short time, take everything of value, rinse, repeat. Maybe yeah. it wouldn't rinse. In salt water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or he can have his men take other islands simultaneously. Given the example in the Forsaken at the Isle of Pigs, he apparently burns them afterwards. Unfortunately for the new lords he made at the Shield Islands, he <laughs> expects the same will essentially happen to them. Yep. The winds of winter. The Forsaken. Why should I want to hold them? The shields have served my purpose. I took them with one hand and gave them away with the other. A great king is open-handed, brother. It is up to the new lords to hold them now. The glory of winning those rocks will be mine forever. When they are lost, the defeat will belong to the four fools who so eagerly accepted my gifts. So it doesn't look like he's keeping much of what he takes. So that leads us to a terrifying thought. If he takes Old Town... Please, please, Euron, don't burn the Citadel. Yeah, that'd be a repeat of the destruction of the City of Scholars, Salash, you know, which was destroyed by the Dithraki during the Century of Blood. Yeah. Which is funny because we're calling this battle the Battle of Blood. Oh, man. <laughs> the parallels are terrifyingly close. <laughs> Though I'm curious, too, if he's going to steal any glass candles or something like that. Whatever artifacts he can take, objects of power that have been lying dormant, you know, like the glass candles have just now become active again. Euron, having been east, he knows more maybe than even some of these maesters do. And of course, they're all poo-poo about magic in general. So he may know what to do with some of these things that are just lying around. In any case, it's going to be interesting to see further expansion. I mean, further devastation. Okay, both. Maybe. Yeah, it'll be both, both yeah. yeah. For example, like, how is he going to interact with Dorne in the short term? I mean, they're a lot less vulnerable at sea. They don't, you know, the whole southern coast of Dorne is really hostile from a terrain perspective, there are no <laughs> ports and, and things like that. So they may not be in the picture for him right now, but if he wants to take the Iron Throne, he's going to have to sail around Dorne. And, you know, because I don't think he's going to go marching his army up the Rose Road from Old Town. Okay. I think he's going to probably stay at sea as much as possible. So Dorne may be getting involved later, but right now it's kind of hard to see how that'll go. So we'll see. Yeah. One thing that Euron has been keeping is ships. When we see him at the end of the Forsakens, he has a lot of captured merchant ships with him, not unlike what Victarion has done on the other side of the world. That's right. They 
pack their ships full of men, take more ships, and they're good at running these ships with a small crew. So they're, they've expanded quite a bit. And speaking of, does anyone know the Iron Fleet sailed from the east apart from the Ironborn? Perhaps not, since the people in Old Town don't even recognize Euron's sigil. They're certainly not going to know where his other ships are if they don't even know who he is. They don't really seem to be up on the doings of the Ironborn in general. And Old Town is supposed to be a center of information. So if Old Town doesn't know, then it's probably not widely known at all. But if they do, they might think it's an advantage. They might think they have an advantage. They might say, hey, this is a time to go fight Euron. His best ships are somewhere gone. And by the time of Kevin's epilogue in A Dance with Dragons, he knows that the Red Wine fleet is dealing with Euron. Euron, unsurprisingly, knows this too. Some might think this is evidence of sorcery, like a glass candle. Note the precision of his information here. The winds of winter, the forsaken. The red wine fleet creeps toward us. The winds have been against them, rounding dawn. But they're finally near enough to have emboldened that old woman in Old Town. So now, late in Hightower's sons move down the whispering sound, in hopes of catching us in the rear. The simpler explanation for how they know these things is by captured messages. They have taken numerous strongholds, and thus whatever messages have been passed around are theirs too. Now recall that Jon Snow received regular Raven updates from the Maester at Sea with Cotter Pike, for example. Yeah, I think this is a much simpler and more likely to be accurate explanation, but there is a possibility that there's sorcery in play, and it could also be both. On the other side of things, so to speak, the Iron Fleet has lost quite a lot of its number. Perhaps too many for Storms to explain it, meaning what Victorian's dealing with. Many theories have come from this, and one that I think deserves mention is that they could be coming to take the Red Wine Fleet in the rear, just as the Red Wine Fleet is trying to trap the Greyjoy Fleet and take it in the rear. We'll see. And guesses aside as to how Euron will handle it, well, there are now... Priests on prows, <laughs> a fleet of captured merchant ships, and a lot of confidence. So we know something is up. Not a king, a god king. The winds of winter, the forsaken. I curse you all, Aaron said. Your curses have no power here, priest, said left-hand Lucas Cod. The crow's eye has fled your drowned god well, and he has grown fat with sacrifice. Words of wind. But blood is power. We have given thousands to the sea, and he has given us victories. Euron doesn't just want to be a king. He wants to be a god king. Left hand Lucas Cod and many of Euron's men use some telling language here. Your drowned god. It should be all of theirs, but Euron's results prove to them that the drowned god is on their side. What he wants to be is not unlike the traditions of the Far East in places like Yi-T, places old in power, places where Euron has been. One point of view who has been to those parts can enlighten us further. A dance with dragons, Melisandre. Snow still chose to dwell behind the armory in a pair of modest rooms previously occupied by the Watch's late blacksmith. Perhaps he did not think himself worthy of the King's Tower, or perhaps he did not care. That was his mistake. The false humility of youth that is itself a sort of pride. It was never wise for a ruler to eschew the trappings of power, for power itself flows in no small measure from such trappings. To further Melisandre's point, think about how you felt when you first read the words Valyrian steel armor, right? It was like, oh, wow. The way the room at Balticon reacted and the way I know I felt. Imagine if it was real. Imagine... Aaron really existing and seeing Valyrian steel armor. Imagine how he actually felt. That's what it's really like. It makes Euron seem immensely powerful, even though he may have just simply stolen this armor or found it somewhere. Even if some of his power is achieved through the use of artifice, from afar, it's going to seem real. Melisandre makes herself seem more than she is by mixing real magic with tricks that are basically just chemistry. She's got these powders that, you know, do fancy things. And people think it's sorcery, but it's just chemistry. Euron thinks on this level as well. As we talked about earlier, his attack on the Shield Islands was seen by many as some sort of sorcery being involved. But to me, to us, <laughs> it was just good seamanship, advanced seamanship, modern techniques. There was nothing magical about it. Just like how the Ironborn perceive the kiss of life that everyone is drowned receives. They think it's magical, but it's just CPR. 
Yeah, exactly. If he lures a kraken to the surface with blood, that's basically just knowing how to bait a really huge fish. But men will tell each other that Euron summoned or commanded a kraken. Maybe he'll even blow a horn just for the hell of it to make it look like a true magical artifact. And maybe this is why he's using priests. Others will think the holy blood was why the kraken came, but really, any blood in large enough amounts would have worked. Yeah. When he cuts out a tongue, he's also denying that person the ability to pray to their gods. This is particularly striking when we see that this has been done to some septums. Not only is Euron denying that the gods exist, he's cutting people off from their beliefs in the most brutal way, and in doing so, demanding that they worship him instead. Especially in Euron's case, even though Euron still has his tongue. A feast for crows, the drowned man. Even a priest may doubt, even a prophet may know terror. Aaron Damphair reached within himself for his god and discovered only silence. See, George can make puns too, only silence. But that's a chilling one, not a funny one. It's exactly what we're talking about. Euron taking the place of gods. Euron tries to find comfort in his god and his silence. Daenerys is literally worshipped. Her deeds are certainly a part of that, but her dragons are an even bigger part of that. Yeah, note in particular the complete about face of her Dothraki blood riders, who refused to even be made blood riders originally before the hatching, versus after when they dropped to their knees desperately and with complete sincerity. They worshipped her from then on, and the dragons proved the stories to other mother of dragons. Right. No one doubts it because the dragons are real. This is what Euron is looking for. Not just authority, but worship. He wants to go beyond basic followers. Imagine what men will say if Euron brings a storm, or better, a kraken. It's the same kind of, this person is doing things that shouldn't be possible. The same thing that Daenerys has. And that's why Euron wants it from his brother, the Damp Hair, a known devout priest. If such a zealous man switched and instead preached for the crow's eye, it would speak volumes. John is headed this way too, you know? Right. An undead skin changer wielding Valyrian steel. <laughs> and Bran, obviously, is, well, another story, but his powers are clearly very substantial. Yeah. All three of Bran, John, and Daenerys could come in direct or indirect conflict with Euron. Others will too, I would think. Others, you uh, say? Well, maybe, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but of them all, Danny still seems to be the most likely, the most foreshadowed. So starting with the most obvious bit, Euron's plan to have Victorian go after her. That's not even foreshadowing. That's just a guy with a plan. He's said out loud, and that's in progress. A feast for crows, the reaver. The dragon queen awaits me in marine. The fairest woman in the world, if my brother could be believed. Her hair is silver gold. Her eyes are amethysts. Okay, well, I guess I lied there. The plan is not straightforward at all. Euron is not going to be outsmarted by his brother. <laughs> the dusky woman, dragon binder, the whole plan. Victorian is being set up. Used as a pawn. He knows this and thinks he's going to outsmart his brother, but really he's just not good at outsmarting people or <laughs> outthinking them at all. I mean, Euron's gifts are poisoned. Yeah, but don't stop there. Predicting exactly how Euron is going to screw over his brother is one thing. But it's a very safe assumption in general, right? Something's going to happen. Euron is not going to be outsmarted by Victorian, right? <laughs> I mean, and if... It, it doesn't have to be either. Maybe neither will ride a dragon. But if you had to pick one, who's more likely? Victorian or Euron? Eh? <laughs> and same with marrying Daenerys. Okay, if you had to pick one, who's more likely? Victorian or Euron? Same answer. And as to that, well, this all has some super ancient foreshadowing. Not a god king. The Bloodstone Emperor, the world of ice and fire. When the daughter of the Opal Emperor succeeded him as the Amethyst Empress, her envious younger brother cast her down and slew her, proclaiming himself the Bloodstone Emperor and beginning a reign of terror. He practiced dark arts, torture and necromancy, enslaved his people, took a tiger woman for his bride, feasted on human flesh, and cast down the true gods to worship a black stone that had fallen from the sky. Many scholars count the Bloodstone Emperor as the first high priest of the sinister Church of Starry Wisdom, which persists to this day in many port cities throughout the known world. 
In our episode on the Great Empire of the Dawn, we showed how well Daenerys fits as a historical parallel for the Amethyst Empress. And in the same vein, by far the best fit for the Bloodstone Emperor is Euron. Casting down the gods definitely sounds like him big time. Reign of Terror, yeah. Dark Arts, yeah. Torture, oh yeah. <laughs> Enslaved his people, yeah, double yeah. <laughs> Feasted on human flesh, well, he's made others do that. And necromancy? Well, let's give him some time. We'll touch on that a little later, too. The tiger woman? Well, we'll see about that one. Yeah, maybe it's a dragon woman or a lion, lion woman. woman. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and perhaps most importantly, the Bloodstone Emperor succeeds. According to this, he slew her. Mm. Well, I don't know about that, but it also says they were related. So this clearly is an exact parallel. Daenerys and Euron aren't related. And I don't think Euron's going to kill Danny, But he could set events in motion that eventually will, maybe? And Quaithe, again, comes to mind. As her prophecies for Danny are a good guideline as to her future in general, right? But finding where Euron fits into those is not so clear. And we showed earlier in the episode that George R. R. Martin removed the reference to him in Quaithe's vision. He might not want to give too much away, so maybe he's holding out a bit, keeping us in the metaphorical dark, before he thrusts us completely and totally into the literal dark, which... By that, I mean the Long Night itself, and the Bloodstone Emperor legend includes this. In the annals of the Further East, it was the Blood Betrayal, as his usurpation is named, that ushered in the Age of Darkness called the Long Night. Despairing of the evil that had been unleashed on Earth, the Maiden Maid of Light turned her back upon the world, and the Lion of Night came forth in all his wrath, to punish the wickedness of men. So we've looked at Euron and his plans for the dragons in prior episodes, and that's important to remember now for a minute, because the dragons are the fire. But what about the ice? How could he possibly play a role in bringing on the Long Night? Poor Quentin will tell us. The Crow's Eye of Winter Earlier I talked about Euron's origins, how a possible past encounter with Bloodraven establishes and grounds all the other weird occult stuff going on in his characterization. That's where Euron is coming from. But where is he going? What's the payoff? How does he intersect with the larger plot and the more central characters? In A Feast for Crows, it can be difficult to suss out what Euron is really up to since he's putting on a show, performing as the ultimate Iron King and fooling almost everyone. It's in The Forsaken that you really get a sense of his plan. The winds of winter, the forsaken. The bleeding star bespoke the end, he said to Aaron. These are the last days when the world shall be broken and remade. A new god shall be born from the graves and charnel pits. That lays it out explicitly as we've seen. Euron wants to instigate the apocalypse and use that sacrifice to make himself a god. And that dovetails with the imagery we've seen relating to his ascendance. A dance with the dragons, Tyrion III. Others seek Daenerys too. One most of all, a tall and twisted thing with one black eye and ten long arms, sailing on a sea of blood. A dance with dragons, Melisandre. I saw towers by the sea, submerged beneath a black and a bloody tide. That is where the heaviest blow will fall. The winds of winter, the forsaken. The dreams were even worse the second time. He saw the longships of the Ironborn, adrift and burning on a boiling blood-red sea. It also fits his general M.O. of swiping artifacts and sources of power from various cultures, all to empower himself. But Euron's not just talking in the Forsaken about a one-off cataclysmic event off the Whispering Sound. He's talking about the end of the entire world, saying that the last days have come. And where does that come from? Well, the answer may be found in a hair-raising nightmare that Daenerys has midway through a dance with dragons. Beneath her coverlets, she tossed and turned, dreaming that Hisdar was kissing her, but his lips were blue and bruised, and when he thrust himself inside her, his manhood was cold as ice. Those blue lips point to Euron. In fact, they're specifically de described as blue and bruised elsewhere. And within the general symbolic language of A Song of Ice and Fire, that cold-as-ice manhood points in one direction, the others, suggesting Euron might at least try to join their ranks. After all, Euron wouldn't be the first to think he could and should handle the power of the White Walkers. See also Night's King, or the Bloodstone Emperor. 
This seems to be a consistent and perhaps even necessary role to be filled in order for the others to attack and bring on the Long Night, a human seduced by their power, believing himself their ally or even their leader. So who's going to fill that role this time around? Euron does fit the bill in terms of apocalyptic imagery and general mad-eyed magical ambition. But what's the evidence that the others specifically would be his vessel? Well, we go back to that childhood dream and his possible contact with Bloodraven. Now, what was it that Bloodraven showed Bran in the latter's own flying dream? A Game of Thrones, Bran three. North and north and north he looked, to the curtain of light at the end of the world, and then beyond that curtain. He looked deep into the heart of winter, and then he cried out, afraid, and the heat of his tears burned on his cheeks. Now you know, the crow whispered as it sat on his shoulder. Now you know why you must live. Why? said Bran, not understanding. Falling, falling. Because winter is coming. This, after all, is why Bloodraven is visiting magically inclined kids in their dreams. To enlist himself in Enderwigan, Harry Potter, Messiah figure in order to fight the others. So if Euron was visited by the Three-Eyed Crow, he knows that winter is coming. And it was with that in mind that the apocalyptic quote from the Forsaken makes a horrifying amount of sense, as does his line from the King's Mood about a crow being able to espy death from afar and all of Westeros is dying. Again, that lays it out. As a crow I can, as I can espy death from afar means the three-eyed crow opened my third eye and I saw the apocalypse coming. Euron is casting himself, both at the King's Moot and in Dampere's visions in the Forsaken, as the crow in the mass graveyard created by the other's return. He will profit from the end of the world. He will feed off it. But how will he get at this power? I mean, that's harder even than traveling to Valyria. That's not just Euron's roadblock, by the way, it's George Martin's. I mean, this has been one of the most obvious questions to ask of this story since it began. How's that wall coming down? The others are clearly going to invade at some point, but how does the author make that happen? Well, he put forward one possible method in A Storm of Swords. A Storm of Swords, John 4. I'm crying because we never found the Horn of Winter. We opened half a hundred graves and let all those shades loose in the world, and never found the Horn of Joram to bring this cold thing down. And then he followed it up with this. A Storm of Swords, John 10. A warhorn, a bloody great warhorn. Yes, Mance said. The Horn of Winter, that Joraman once blew to wake giants from the earth. If you refuse, Mance Raider said, Tormund Giant's Bane will sound the Horn of Winter three days hence at dawn. The Horn of Joraman, the wildlings ace card in their desperate desire to get south of the wall. Except, of course, we later learn that, like so much about Mance Raider, the horn was all smoke and mirrors. A Dance with the Dragons, John 12. Melisandre burned the horn of Joramund. Did she? Tormund slapped his thigh and hooted. She burned that fine big horn. Aye, a bloody sin, I call it. A thousand years old, that was. We found it in a giant's grave. And no man of us had ever seen a horn so big. That must have been why Mance got the notion to tell you it were Joramans. He wanted you crows to think he had it in his power to blow your bloody wall down about your knees. But he never found the true horn. Not for all our digging. If we had, every kneeler in your seven kingdoms would have chunks of ice to cool his wine all summer. John turned in his saddle, frowning. And Joraman blew the horn of winter and woke giants from the earth. The huge horn with its bands of old gold, incised with ancient runes. Had Mance Raider lied to him, or was Tormund lying now? If Mance's horn was just a feint, where is the true horn? Where is the true horn is a pretty big lampshade hanging. Imagine the irony if John himself had the true horn in his hand at one point. Say, in that cache he found at the Fist of the First Men. A Clash of Kings, John Four. Beneath the dragon glass was an old war horn made from an oryx horn and banded in bronze. There's a well-worn trope across genres that when trying to determine what is the genuine article among potentially magical artifacts, the big, shiny, embossed, fancy one is going to turn out to be fake. And not only fake, a trap. A lure for the greedy and the unwise. The real McCoy is going to turn out to be the humble, unassuming one, because that's an easy metaphor for how true heroism is found within. 
An easy example is the Holy Grail in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, and I think the same logic applies here. After all, look what else is left in that cache of the fist. A material that can kill the others. What horn would be worth protecting and keeping secret as much as that? It even works symbolically. Frozen fire and the horn that can summon ice, wrapped up in a Night's Watch cloak for safekeeping, is a perfect representation of John's Ark and of thus the Song of Ice and Fire itself. So what happened to this potential Horn of Winter? Well, John gave it to Sam, and Martin made sure that Sam held on to it throughout his hellish journey back to Castle Black, and on the journey to Bravos, even highlighting it for the reader as the one thing Sam kept, even as he traded everything else for passage to Old Town on the Cinnamon Wind. You could argue it's a red herring, except Mance's horn turned out to be a red herring. This looks more like it's being set up as the real deal, the horn that really could bring down the wall. And Sam, as we see in his last chapter to date, at the end of A Feast for Crows, has brought that horn into the city Euron is invading. Means, motive, and opportunity, as they say. The question of how the wall comes down still stands, and if you put Euron's backstory, general MO and worldview, and the logical, magical context together, a picture emerges of a new knight's king. And this is who Euron wants to be. A feast for crows, the reaver. Perhaps we can fly, all of us. How will we ever know unless we leap from some tall tower? The wind came gusting through the window and stirred his sable cloak. There was something obscene and disturbing about his nakedness. No man ever truly knows what he can do unless he dares to leap. Some tall tower, eh? Look again at Mel's vision. She says the heaviest blow will fall the towers by the sea. So that's Euron's payoff. Blowing the horn of Jormund from atop the high tower, bringing down the wall, and letting the nightmares in. Blood Raven's ends justify the means mindset undercuts his own goal once again, as his rogue pupil puts the world at risk. Everything about Euron suggests a man grasping for earth-shaking power, heedless of what he has to do to get it and what the consequences will be. A perfect herald for the apocalypse. A Feast for Crows. Prologue. Old powers waken, shadows stir, an age of wonder and terror will soon be upon us, an age for gods and heroes. One final nightmarish image to leave you with. How does Euron announce his arrival at the King's Moot? Three horn blasts. And what signals the arrival of the others? Three horn blasts. Three times, right? Euron has the horn blown three times. Damn. Yeah, damn is right. <laughs> Outro. The great span of possibility for Euron is a cornerstone of what makes him compelling. This is a man whose actions can and probably will have a powerful impact on everyone, including the POV characters far and wide. When the winds of winter comes, it'll be a gray, joyous day. Oh. Yeah. Before we end this episode, here are a few more parallels for Euron from ancient myth. These didn't quite fit as well into our narrative, and they, some of these might be a bit of a stretch, but I don't think so. I think there's something here. I think there's some good stuff, so let's go through it. Other historical parallels. The world of ice and fire. Thus we hear of the likes of Torgon the Terrible, Jol the Whale, Dagon Drum the Necromancer, Hrothgar of Pike and his Kraken summoning horn, and Ragged Ralph of Old Wick. Most infamous of all was Balon Blackskin, who fought with an axe in his left hand and a hammer in his right. No weapon made of man could harm him, it was said. Swords glanced off and left no mark, and axes shattered against his skin. Some of these guys ring a few bells. There's another mention of a kraken horn, and most infamous of all, Balon Blackskin definitely sounds reminiscent of a Greyjoy wearing special black armor. And who's more special and black than Euron's? No one's. <laughs> also, Euron is pretty terrible, I'll say. But we'll have to see if there's any necromancer action forthcoming. Although that Bloodstone Emperor stuff makes you think. Yeah. If that were the case, that'd be four out of six. Unless we see <laughs> Euron get fat like a whale. Too much shape. Maybe. I'd like you, to see that. It gives you the munchies. <laughs> So combining some of those ideas would be great. Undead Krakens, right? Now that is a dead thing in the water. <laughs> <laughs> a real large dead thing in the water. How about the Grey King? It was the Grey King who brought fire to the earth by taunting the Storm God until he lashed down with a thunderbolt, setting a tree ablaze. So the parallel between the Grey, Grey King's crown and Euron's is interesting. It's in its place he wore an iron crown whose points were made from the teeth of sharks. Ooh, rough. So... There's a few different things there. You know, we have going against the gods is a major feature of the Grey King. That's a huge one. 
taunting the storm god, Euron sort of does that by claiming he is the storm. You know, it's a I, little... I don't think it pans out. We just talked about it. He has no white or gray hair. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. The Grey King it doesn't work. <laughs> okay, what about the Red Kraken? A different color. Euron's got red, right? So oh, that yeah. works. So, so Dalton Greyjoy was the Red Kraken, and he was a Reaver really young. He wielded a Valyrian steel sword. He did a lot of stuff. He was famous. He had a lot of salt wives. He was cunning and cautious, despite being brave, and he was smart with politics. And, you know, he was basically a bigger thinker than most of the Ironborn. So, a bit of a, you know, this is an ancient history. The Red Kraken, you know, we're talking about during the Dance of Dragons. This is only about 170 years ago. We can go back a little bit further, too, to Heron the Black. Absolutely. Not exactly a Greyjoy, but, you know. Huge close. ambitions that yeah. they had in common, right? And he was going against dragons. Yeah, against Aegon, right? And Heron didn't really care that much about Ironborn culture. He kind of, like Euron, kind of forgot who he was dealing with when he presented his grand plan about the dragons and realized, no, they... They think, they think smaller than this. And Heron was kind of like that. He was more of a mainlander. He lived in the Riverlands his whole life. He didn't really... He was willing to sacrifice the Ironborn to use them as source of men and ships, which is kind of how Euron sees them. He's not really married to his culture. He doesn't really care about them. And Euron even mentions how Aegon only had a few men because he had dragons. <laughs> Whereas in the Heron the Black versus Aegon, it's Aegon <laughs> saying, despite his few men, and Heron pointing out that he has a lot of men, Aegon says, at night, your line will end. <laughs> uh, we'll see how more of the Euron story perhaps brings forward some more of these historical bits as connections. We'll see. What's left to come? When we lay a few things out here, you'll realize how much left there is to see among things we can predict as pretty likely. And most of what there is to come in general, and particularly with Euron, we cannot predict at all. It looks like we're about to witness a sea battle. Yaron hasn't fought anyone yet. And what about his crew? I mean, I mean, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, Yaron hasn't fought anyone yet. We haven't seen how good he is in combat. We've seen how smart he is. What about his, yeah, and his crew? Like, we've got these kind of half-mongrel monsters. Like, I don't know what that really means, because it's filtered through the lens of Victorian and Aaron, and they're really, you know, prejudiced, and yeah. they don't like other cultures. But these guys, like the ape guys... Maybe they're, like, really badass at, like, boarding other ships, at jumping over, and just, I ah, just can't wait to see more of this. Yeah, in our Dragonbinder episode, which we called the Hellhorn, we wondered what will happen when it's blown near Viserion and Rhaegal. In the Forsaken episode, we discussed another kind of horn, which could bless us all with a crack in or three. And remember that Euron keeps pulling out some really cool artifacts. He might not be done with that, for all Ch we know. Yeah, chalk that up as very high on the list of things that could be to come that I'm excited about. <laughs> we'll end this episode with some advice. Of course, we advocate rereads in general, but I highly suggest if you don't do a full reread, reread the Ironborn chapters with the Forsaken chapter in mind. It changes the whole picture. Shed so much light on what's happening. It's just an entirely different experience. And prepare yourself, because for Euron to have impact as a character, for him to be a major villain, he's going to have to make some of our favorites suffer. He hasn't done that yet. He's only made Aaron suffer, and a lot of people that we don't have a lot of connection to. He's going to come in contact with characters we actually care about. Now, that's going to be hard. <laughs> that's going to be hard, but it's also going to be fun, and we can't wait. So Valar, reread us. Even more people than usual to thank for this episode. Of course, huge thanks to poor Quentin for his large contributions to this episode. Also thanks to Rainey's Targaryen for the fact-checking and additional ideas. Huge shout-out to all the artists whose work was featured in this episode. Azani, Mike Hallstein, Dejan Delic, Draftergy, Arthur Mosca, and The Three Hairs. You may have noticed quite a few different voices present in this episode as well. Big thanks to Martin Lewis, a.k.a. The Reader, Echoes of Ice and Fire on Facebook, also Mikhail Schick of Vassals of Kingsgrave and Hypable.com. Joining us for the first time as a voice contributor is Don the Kraken Wit, good friend of ours. You can find him on his YouTube channel at Don the Kraken Wit, where he's also done a full reading of The Forsaken. Thanks to Michael Klarfeld of Claradox.de for the video intro and the maps that you see behind us. Thanks to Joey Townsend and Jesse Koval for the intro and outro music, respectively. So that's certainly the most people we've ever had involved in an episode, but none of it would be possible without our patrons. So thanks to 
the mysterious BR, Hand of the King, Lord Jim the Fortuitous of the Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire, and Warden of the West. Lord George Stormsville the Cunning, Lord of the Chiliad and Warden of the East. Cabeth the Unfrozen, Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light and Warden of the North. Lady Kelly McMath of Covington, Lady of the Villa Hills and Crescent Springs, Warden of the South. Welcome to our first ever Blood Rider, Koho Koi, Master of the Bow, called Sun Piercer. Koho Koi's sister's ex-husband Kevin was given a treatment worthy of Viserys himself. A crown of molten gold. Good riddance. Our small council is Lord James Inkblade, the Scholar Knight, Master of Whisperers. Grand Maester Saria of the Barrows is Cinder of the Citadel. Lord Robert Jacobs is Master of Coin. Rosie the Clever is Master of Laws. And Lord James Tuttle is Master of Ships. There's a rumor going around that Lord James Tuttle has great ambitions. We'll keep an eye on that. Thanks also to Lady Dire Liz of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. Lord Dan of the Red Mountains and Castle Great Bell is Breaker of the Second Stone. Lord Skip of the Velt is Lord of Castle Ganges. Mary Meg is the Lady of the Bloody Stepstones. Gregor the Toasty is still Lord of the Breadford. Alicia Everlasting of the Greenblood is Lady of the Desert Rose. Lord Ryan of Castle Stonegate is Guardian of the Rocky Mountain Pass. Lord Garen de Havilland is a Devil's Hand Keep. Ashlyn Winter is the Hawk's Eye, Lady of Castle Skyfall. Lady Mikkel of Moonacre is leader of the Werewood Protectorate Alliance for Game of Thrones Ascent, the Facebook game. Lord Barone of Hillcrest, Lord of the Halls and wielder of the Valyrian Steel Machete, Everglazed. Lord Alistair Whitaker is Lord of the Dawnhold. Lord Demi Snugglebunny is guardian of the hidden Hundred Acre Werewood and holder of the Vorpal Snugglebunny. Lord Osborne is of Castle Werewood. Our roots run deep. Lord Brandon Brewer of Castle Blackrune is sworn alesmith to House Stark, Grand Master of the Zithamancer's Guild, and Keeper of the Buzz. Lord Imriel is of House Jordain, and Brian the Defender is Lord of the Spearfort and the Freelands, Last Scion of Clan McCulloch, Strength and Courage. Our King's Justice is Sir Troy the Steady, wielder of the Valyrian Steel Blade Fate. The Lord Commander of the History of Westeros Kingsguard is Sir Christopher Dane of Starfall, Sentinel of the Torrentine. The History of Westeros Night's Watch is commanded by Lord Commander Daenerys Flint of the Nightfort, avenging the memory of Brave Dan. First Ranger Fabian Flowers, the Bastard of Green Shield, and First Builder Patchface of Motley Wisdom. We now have two episodes that are for patrons or donators only. If you would like to get access to those, sign up for Patreon at any level and you'll get them. If you want to get them manually, just send us a donation through the PayPal link on our website, historyofwesteros.com, and we'll send them to you through a link. For other ways to support the show, historyofwesteros.com's got quite a few. You can, for example, shop through our Amazon links, and anything you buy through Amazon, whether it's one of the suggested items we have there or not, is going to give us a little bit of credit and help out the show. And you'll see there that we've got a list of quite a few Game of Thrones, I Song of Ice and Fire related books, side material, games, things like that. Lots of fun stuff, stuff that we recommend, stuff that we've used ourselves. That's it for now. See you next time, again, Valar Reredus. Reredus.